Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining this workshop, a conversation on disinformation and democracy. Today, we have six legal scholars from points around the globe to discuss chapters they are preparing for a forthcoming volume examining different approaches to regulating disinformation. Columbia Global Freedom of Expression was really excited to co-host this event with the University of Alabama School of Law. For those of you who are not familiar with our work, Global Freedom of Expression hosts a database of international case law that currently includes an case analyses of more than 2,000 court decisions pertaining to freedom of expression from more than 130 countries. We've been monitoring the evolution of disinformation for quite a few years. In 2016, worries about the harmful effects of online mis- and disinformation became global. The presidency of Donald Trump, the UK vote for Brexit, killings in India and Myanmar in the wake of violent messages spread on WhatsApp were a wake-up call for the world. Since then, the spread of vaccine rejection, COVID denialism, and disinformation about Russia's Ukraine war, misinformation spread by leading politicians in many parts of the world, including Hungary, the US, and Brazil, and the growth of generative AI has made it clear that online mis- and disinformation is a problem that is here to stay. Starting in 2021, global freedom of expression began to systematically identify and analyze important court decisions relating to online fake news, disinformation and misinformation. So the research was done in partnership with UNESCO, uh, particularly as it related to medical misinformation during the pandemic, and then also with the Danish think tank Justicia as part of the Future of Free Speech project. Over the next year, we hope to identify decisions relating to elections and disinformation. The research thus far has aimed to explore how courts are addressing the rise in claims relating to the spread of falsehoods and their new guises under the label of fake news and misinformation. As a starting point, we felt it was important to understand how courts are defining the issues, what laws and standards they are relying on, and what tests they are applying. We're really eager to learn about new decisions and legal approaches from these scholars contributing to this volume. Our re research will ultimately culminate in a special collection paper on emerging legal standards relating to disinformation. Our special collection paper series aims to provide a global outlook of some of the most significant legal decisions adopted by national and international tribunals on relevant topics regarding freedom of expression. So please stay tuned to our website for that. Um, so now that the much anticipated Dominion suit has been settled, we're all on the edge of our seats here in the U.S. waiting for the Supreme Court to rule on the net choice cases, which will determine if and how the U.S. government will regulate social media. Meanwhile, the U.K., according to an Ofcom staffer, um, has said that there's been a cognitive shift in the U.K.'s plans to pass the online harm safety bill by the end of 2023. The U has uh, led the charge on these issues by deciding to regulate the very large online platforms, culminating in the 2022 EU package of laws, the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act. As we speak, Brazil is updating its Marco Civil and the UN is expected in 2024 to begin discussions on the Global Digital Compact. The conversation has now turned to how and whether the Brussels effect will kick in and whether EU legislation will be adopted in other parts of the world. The DSA is often compared to banking regulations as the role of government is to check the processes in place to see whether they are effective, not necessarily to censor individual pieces of content. Many of these laws apply extraterritorially and the implications are still unclear. The discussions today will look at a range of solutions being tried and may and many will bring a legal lens to a vexing global problem. And a little bit of housekeeping, the format for today will be three panels. The first panel will go until about 1145, at which time we will take a break until one o'clock New York time. Then there will be two panels uh, in the afternoon going until four about 4 p.m. New York time. The chat is enabled and we encourage viewers to post any comments or questions, which I'll be monitoring and um, we'll be happy to pose those to the panelists uh, at the appropriate time. So, and with that, it's my great pleasure to introduce one of the lead organizers behind the volume, Ron Protasinski. 
Uh, he is the John S. Stone Chairholder of Law and the Director of Faculty Research at the University of Alabama School of Law. Ron has clerked for the Honorable Frank M. Johnson Jr. of the United States Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit and was an associate with Covington and Burling in D.C. Prior to joining the faculty at the University of Alabama School of Law, he served on the law faculty at Washington and Lee University, and prior to that, on the law faculty of the Indiana University School of Law, Indianapolis. And with that, I give the floor to Ron. Thank you so much. It's great to be here, and I want to thank uh, Holly Johnson and the Global Freedom of Expression uh, Project for sponsoring this workshop for these uh, chapters in progress. Uh, to uh, amplify a little bit of the introductory material, uh, I think January 6, 2021 sort of uh, pointed out uh, the clear and present dangers that currently exist to the project of democratic self-government, certainly here in the United States, but on a global basis as well. Last year's election in Brazil was rife, for example, with efforts to use disinformation and misinformation to mislead, deceive, and even stop voters from casting ballots in the presidential election. So it's it's not just a U.S. problem, it's a global problem, and a global problem would benefit from systematic comparative legal analysis of what works and what doesn't work. Uh, the book, uh, under contract to Cambridge University Press, uh, God willing, uh, should publish uh, next summer in advance of the U.S. general election. And uh, will feature uh, three sort of general uh, vectors for potential analysis and intervention, uh, new government regulation, self-regulation, and mixed uh, government-raised eyebrow regulation of the press, traditional press, uh, mass media, uh, social media, and the potential role of non-governmental organizations in civil society. And our panels today will track those three general uh, organizational areas, government intervention, uh, self and uh, mixed regulation of the press and media, and uh, the potential uh, uh, role of uh, non-governmental organizations, civil society organizations in addressing uh, disinfo and misinfo. So uh, that's sort of what brings us uh, to New York and to this event. And uh, I think that we're in for a lot of interesting uh, papers. That's my hope in any event. So uh, let me also introduce my co-panelist, Joanna Bota. She is the uh, head of school at Nelson Mandela University and in South Africa, and is arguably the leading free speech scholar, or certainly one of the leading free speech scholars in South Africa. She's written broadly and lucidly about freedom of expression, not only in South Africa, but in Africa generally. And uh, she'll be speaking second on this panel. Uh, my own... Uh, chapter uh, for the book is the introduction, uh, sort of a framing enterprise, which is, I think, a good way to kick off this meeting, uh, tentatively entitled Disinformation, Misinformation, and Democracy, Defining the Problem, Identifying Effective Solutions, and the Potential Merits of Using a Comparative Legal Approach. The chapter will actually do the easiest part of the, uh, the, the job, which is to sort of demonstrate why disinfo and misinfo are problems. Uh, the problem, I think, came into very clear focus with Donald Trump's big lie uh, in the uh, aftermath of the November 2020 general election in the United States. This led, as everyone is aware, to an armed attack, an insurrection on January 6, 2021, uh, aimed at disrupting the Electoral College ballot count by the U.S. House of Representatives and Senate. Some of the people on January 6 actually brought the ties that police use. Uh, I think perhaps with the goal or intention of taking Nancy Pelosi and Vice President Pence hostage. The whole thing was shocking and uh, happened uh, live and in real time. Uh, and uh, nothing much has been done really uh, to, at least in the United States, uh, uh, address uh, in a systematic and thoughtful sort of way the conditions that gave rise to convincing people that an armed insurrection and attack on the U.S. Capitol was necessary, ironically enough, to save uh, democracy. And uh, we seem to be in a Nietzschean pattern of eternal recurrence, do we not? Donald J. Trump is once again running for president, uh, largely on the idea that the 2020 election was stolen from him. And indeed, there are now many me DJTs, people like Carrie Lake in Arizona, who claims to be the sitting governor, although uh, she wasn't sworn in, litigation continues. Uh, the attacks in the United States on the reliability and legitimacy of the electoral process are rampant, ongoing, uh, and unabating. 
And uh, increasingly, uh, it's not just a question of uh, voters casting misinformed or poorly informed ballots, but voters losing confidence in the mechanics and architecture of democracy itself. Uh, the ultimate goal, I think, of uh, organizations like QAnon is to disrupt or destroy uh, democratic self-government as, as it has been practiced uh, at least since 1965 in the Voting Rights Act. It's sort of ironic to talk about democracy prior to 1965, so we'll just put a pin in that. So the, the problem actually uh, goes even further back, uh, uh, arguably to the 2016 uh, general election, which featured crazy disinfo and misinfo campaigns that undoubtedly affected the outcome of that election, which was decided essentially by around 72,000 votes distributed across five states out of hundreds of millions of votes cast. Perhaps the most famous or infamous uh, disinformation effort was the uh, Pizzagate affair involving Hillary Rodham Clinton being alleged to uh, run a child sex trafficking operation out of a DC pizzeria. Uh, the pizzeria was actually named, uh, I won't name it today. Uh, and it actually led a fellow from North Carolina to go up to Washington DC with a gun to liberate the uh, trafficked uh, child sex workers. There were other efforts at disinformation. Uh, for example, Pope Francis endorsing Donald J. Trump for president. Uh, in fact, uh, a, a good number of uh, Republican voters, about 46% of GOP voters, according to reliable polling data, believe to, the, to this day that Hillary Clinton operated a, a child sex trafficking ring out of a pizzeria in DC. I have to say, I find that a profoundly depressing statistic, but let me be bipartisan. 40% uh, of Democrats believe that Russia didn't merely interfere in the 2016 election, but actually manipulated the vote totals. I had a conservative student, at, I, was, I was going off on Republicans believing Pizzagate, hand goes up, Fed Sox student tells me, well, Democrats believe Russians uh, stuff the ballot boxes. And I'm like, no, we don't. Uh, but then I started Googling and I found a Gallup poll that showed 40% of Democrats believe that Russians didn't merely meddle by, by trying to uh, depress Democratic Party voter turnout and increase Republican Party turnout, but actually hacked the computers and stuffed ballot boxes in states to, to flip the outcomes. Uh, and uh, for those of you who are not familiar with QAnon, I'm not going to spend a lot of time or energy sort of laying out their, their doctrines, but they make the John Birch Society of the 1960s look like a portrait of rationality. Uh, fluoride being a plot by communists pales in comparison to QAnon, the main theme of which is that the Democratic Party, as I understand it, uh, is a front for a global child pedophilia ring. To even say it forces one to blush, but, but there it is. Uh, and yet millions of Americans uh, belong to social media websites associated with QAnon. And sincerely, you know, I, I'd like to believe, many of us would probably like to believe that these folks don't actually subscribe to this, that it's kind of a joke to them. But I, I don't think that's the case. I, I believe we have millions of voters who believe that the Democratic Party and its leadership uh, constitute a, a well-organized uh, ring uh, to facilitate acts of pedophilia. Uh, and, and so uh, the problem is, is not new, but I think it's pretty clear after 2016 and 2020, at least in the U.S., that the scope of the problem is new. It's greater, wider, broader, deeper. Uh, again, the John Birch Society of the 1960s with its claims about fluoride and Earl Warren uh, look affirmatively quaint juxtaposition. Now, what are the sources of the problem uh, with respect to, to disinfo, misinfo, and the uh, subversion of democracy? Uh, well, social media is very much uh, arguably the villain in this story, particularly uh, when coupled with the social or psychological phenomena of the siloing of voters in echo chambers. Uh, what is siloing? Siloing is uh, the self-organization of citizens into groups organized on social media that interact with each other, but not with others. And the siloed social media groups uh, create an echo chamber effect in which everyone seems to take the same position and agree. And so you have a sort of confirmation bias and a kind of hurt effect. And uh, the, the consequences of this 
for democratic deliberation and meaningful interaction among voters are, are quite bad, devastating, in fact. So uh, social scientists have found that within these siloed echo chambers, people will cling to the mask of falsity uh, uh, very strongly. More depressing still, when mainstream media outlets, including conservative uh, media outlets like Fox News or the Wall Street Journal, try to correct the record on matters like Pizzagate, for example, uh, those within the siloed echo chambers actually believe the falsehoods with even greater passion. Efforts at correction by traditional media, even of a conservative bent, tend to backfire. Uh, this has led to uh, a radical increase in the polarization of the American electorate. Now, to be fair, polarization has always been around. It wasn't as if the election of 1800 between John Adams and Thomas Jefferson was an example of uh, dispassionate reasoned discourse. Uh, they fought dirty in the 1800s and in the late uh, uh, 18th and early 19th century. Uh, but there was still more interaction between groups that disagreed uh, the Federalist and Anti-Federalist Papers, for example, regarding the desirability of ratifying the Constitution of 1787 were published essays in which folks engaged each other uh, in the press and in a sustained and fairly uh, thoughtful way. Uh, today, uh, the traditional media are simply not trusted, not trusted by conservatives, but also not trusted by progressives. Uh, and media is increasingly uh, tribalized. Uh, again, this is not new. Uh, the press during the uh, Jefferson and Adams election of 1800 was certainly partisan, but this uh, hiving off of groups of voters into tribes with little, if any, meaningful interaction between the tribes does seem to be to be something new. The other thing that we learned from the Facebook whistleblower is that to keep eyeballs on screens and people engaging, anger uh, rather than uh, uh, happiness or contentment keeps you using Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. So the algorithms associated with uh, these social media platforms uh, favor profit, and favoring profit means stirring people up, not calming people down. So we have a financial incentive by for-profit corporations to make voters angry. And I think anger is not a, a very good way to achieving higher levels of meaningful interaction between people who disagree with each other about candidates, public policy, and the direction the country should be taking. Um, and the larger problem is, you know, maybe in the 70s or 80s, we disagreed on policy, trickle down economics and the Reagan administration, tax cuts for the rich and corporations. Today, we disagree on basic facts. The sky is blue, grass is green. <laughs> so uh, today, when falsehood circulates, uh, uh, correction is difficult, if not impossible, uh, within uh, these groups of uh, siloed uh, voters within echo chambers. And uh, again, social science seems to suggest fairly strongly uh, that efforts at correction by traditional media, by responsible journalists, actually backfires. And on these points, I would commend Hashtag Republic by Cass Sunstein and Martha's, Martha Minow's a relatively new book on saving democracy. So uh, lastly, in terms of defining the problem, the cost of propagating lies is de minimis. And uh, with algorithmic targeting of the recipients of particular messages on social media, devastatingly, incredibly effective. Uh, 2016 and the use of Facebook to manipulate voter turnout is particularly instructive. Uh, efforts were made uh, essentially to convince Black voters that their votes didn't matter and the entire system was rigged, nothing to see here, don't bother to vote, stay home, and to rile uh, potential MAGA voters into uh, going to uh, the polls in droves. So there are systematic efforts uh, on social media to uh, deceive voters to convince voters not to vote or to convince voters to vote based on literally facts that are falsifiable. And if democracy is to function as a means of legitimating government institutions uh, and as a means of securing good governance, uh, we need at least the marginal voter whose vote makes the majority to be casting a rational ballot. Now, for the record, uh, for myself and for my co-editors and for the participants uh, who are contributing chapters in this book, we don't take the position that a particular partisan outcome is necessary for voting to be informed and rational. We take the view individually and collectively 
that voters should not be casting ballots premised on false empirical facts. And yet, increasingly, that's what we see happening. The problem is vast and growing. Uh, disinfo and misinfo, I think, constitute cancers uh, on democracy and the democratic process. Uh, and again, it's not just a U.S. problem. It's a global problem. Uh, the Cambridge Analytica releases suggest that the Brexit, Brexit vote, which was so close, uh, was manipulated successfully through uh, disinfo and misinfo. Brazil's recent election uh, was also plagued with efforts to deceive, harass, and impede voters. And the democratic process and democratic institutions seem to be under siege, again, not just in the United States, but, but frankly, on a global basis. That said, it is easier, far easier, to define the problem than it is to offer effective solutions. So what pathways to addressing disinfo and misinfo uh, seem to exist that, that might be uh, effective and do more harm than good? I think as a first principle, we have to make sure that the cure is not worse than the disease. The first and the most obvious would, of course, be new and better government regulation. And we see efforts at new and better government regulation in Europe and even here in the United States. Second, uh, self-regulation or mixed self-government regulation, uh, a combination of, of regulation by raised eyebrow or the threat of regulation by government to get uh, the traditional print press, broadcasters, and social media to do a better job of, of policing themselves. Uh, the third general vector of intervention might come from non-governmental organizations and civil society organizations. An example of that, for example, uh, sorry, example, example, uh, Justice O'Connor and the O'Connor Institute uh, have been uh, very actively engaged in civics education efforts in the United States, uh, as well as media literacy efforts. Uh, she's also been associated with a program called iCivics, which seeks to teach civics more comprehensively to U.S. school kids in the K through 12 uh, grades. So uh, iCivics and the O'Connor Institute's efforts at voter education and sort of citizen readiness constitute a kind of civil society organization response on a long range uh, perspective or a long range approach to creating citizens who are savvier and better able to identify uh, truth and falsehood uh, or inform themselves effectively as voters. So starting with the first of these three possibilities, government regulation. Uh, government regulation certainly could help, but it could do more harm than good. A an example or a QED is the Biden administration's fairly disastrous effort with its disinformation uh, government board. Uh, this was organized uh, by the Biden administration within the Department of Homeland Security. It was mocked relentlessly on Tucker Carlson, maybe Fox News, uh, and uh, the right went sort of nuts over uh, a government truth squad being located within a government law enforcement agency. The Biden administration initially, after three weeks, suspended the uh, DSG, uh, or the GBD, I should say. And in August of 2022, uh, the, the uh, disinformation government board was, was quietly abolished uh, completely. So that represents a kind of intervention that I think probably did more harm than good. Locating it in the Department of Homeland Security probably wasn't a great idea. Uh, trying to organize it uh, arguably on a partisan basis probably didn't help, but it was well-intentioned and the effort was essentially to create within the Department of Homeland Security uh, a kind of entity that would do what the FTC does with respect to false and deceptive trade practices, right? If you claim your patent medicine cures cancer uh, or that Invermectin cures COVID, uh, we want the FDA or the FTC to intervene and provide accurate and truthful information uh, regarding drug efficacy or uh, the financial risks associated with an IPO and SEC regulations that compel mandatory disclosures. The problem increasingly in the United States is that people don't trust the government. Uh, and this problem of lack of trust in government seems to be growing elsewhere as well. Uh, the assumption seems to be that those in government are self-interested and can't be relied upon to provide truthful, accurate, and complete information. Uh, it seems to me, though, that, that the failure of the disinformation uh, uh, government board in the United States 
should not be taken to mean that government interventions per se uh, are doomed to failure. Clearly, they need to be thoughtful, well-designed, probably as much as possible nonpartisan and transparent. Uh, and my hope is that some of the chapters in the book will discuss government interventions that are doing more good than harm. The, Aristotle said there's wisdom in crowds in his, uh, in his uh, politics, referring to juries. Uh, and I think it is quite possible to learn from both interventions that failed, uh, like the Biden administration's DGB, but also from interventions that have proved to be more efficacious and that have been successful in uh, providing voters with access to truthful, accurate, and complete information in a transparent way. Now, uh, the press, self-regulation by the press, uh, or perhaps some sort of mixed form of government press self-regulation along the lines of, for example, uh, the Press Complaints Commission in the UK. Uh, the problem uh, with the press is that the responsible players are not the problem, right? The New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, uh, press entities that practice responsible journalism uh, are ready, willing, and able to correct the record when they get something wrong. Uh, the problem with the press arises from sort of oddball uh, institutions uh, and websites like Infowars, Breitbart, Breitbart OAN, One American News, uh, and Newsmax. We might put Fox News uh, on that list as well, uh, given the recent settlement and the revelations and the uh, discovery associated uh, with Dominion's suit. <clears throat> But to be fair and balanced, to use Fox's tagline, uh, there are those who think MSNBC and even the New York Times are not always fair, reliable, and uh, 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 nonpartisan or apartisan. Same thing for CNN. Uh, people simply don't trust the press or the mass media any more than they trust the government. So, uh, and, and this relates back to the point I made earlier involving social science. Uh, uh, psychology showing that when people hold false beliefs and the New York Times or CNN or the Wall Street Journal try to correct it, that people within these siloed echo chambers tend to hold fast to the mass of falsity with greater fervor and intensity. Uh, so given this lack of trust in the news media, even if the news media tries to do a better job, and even if these less responsible outlets could somehow be brought to book, it's unclear to me that uh, there are any easy or simple or uh, solutions that are capable of, of direct and efficacious implementation. Uh, with respect to social media, take for example, the problem of content moderation. If you do it uh, based on algorithms, there are gonna be a lot of mistakes, a lot of false positives and false negatives with respect to moderation. And then how do you moderate someone like Donald Trump uh, you know, he, he's sort of unique. Uh, and to the extent that you moderate his comments, you run the risk of alienating uh, vast numbers of users. For a for-profit corporation, this presents an interesting set of problems that are wholly unrelated to democracy and directly related to the bottom line. Uh, government uh, could encourage perhaps best practices, uh, regulation through raised eyebrow, uh, but uh, it's unclear to me that the worst offenders would agree to cooperate with efforts uh, to promote best practices or regulation by raised eyebrow. If the worst offenders don't reform themselves, the problems of disinfo and misinfo leading to poorly informed ballots or ballots premised on false facts uh, will go on unabated and will continue to grow. For myself, uh, I wonder if non-governmental organizations and civil society organizations might represent the best way forward. Why do I say that? Well, uh, with respect to COVID vaccine uptake uh, in the rural South, states like Mississippi and Alabama, uh, having Dr. Fauci run uh, uh, public service announcements did no good. Having celebrities uh, like Michael Jordan or Charles Barkley run radio and TV announcements did no good. What worked to get uh, local folks to take COVID vaccine or accept vaccination? Uh, their local physicians in community clinics in places like the Mississippi Delta. So where a community organization with trusted uh, uh, and known individual professionals said, this is not Tuskegee 2.0, this will protect your health, this will protect you from serious illness or death, uptake went up. 
Uh, the other thing about non-governmental organizations and civil society organizations is that they're self-constituted communities. You don't have to join the Elks or the JCs or a labor union. Well, you might sometimes have to join a labor union, but I'll leave that to Charlotte later. Uh, but in, in general, uh, they're voluntary and you choose to associate. And in that sense, you have a common uh, religious organizations, churches, uh, professional organizations, the ABA, the AMA, uh, et cetera. Uh, and so because these are voluntary associations that are sort of organically self-organized, uh, they're a kind of, uh, I don't want to say that they're echo chambers, they're not, but they have credibility within their membership. So that if civil society organizations or non-governmental non organizations were to engage in a serious way with civics education, with media literacy efforts uh, and the like, uh, I think there's a, a real and uh, promising way forward to empowering more voters to cast ballots that uh, reflect objective facts rather than, than falsehoods. What is the problem or the downside? Well, uh, these organizations are dying on the vine. Membership in the ABA uh, has never been lower. I used to serve on one of the section's uh, councils, and every council meeting was a horror story about diminished subscription and how do we get more members? Uh, you know, uh, I, I forget the exact title of the book, but it's something along the lines of whatever happened to the bowling alley. The idea of having a bowling league where you go bowling on Thursday night. Bowling alone. Oh, what was it? Bowling alone. Bowling alone. Thank you. <laughs> so yes, bowling alone. Now we spend all of our time ceaselessly doing this uh, by ourselves rather than enacting in real time uh, in, in collective uh, uh, environments with other people. So while civil society organizations, I think, probably have the most credibility and therefore at least potentially have the best possibility of, of staging successful interventions to empower voters to, to cast uh, better informed ballots, these organizations uh, seem to not be flourishing. And in that sense, then, if the solution relates to a set of institutions that is sickly, their ability to get the job done might be open to question. Uh, that said, these entities have the power to persuade with their members precisely because their members trust them, and uh, these institutions have credibility uh, with their members. Um, and again, uh, to repeat something I said earlier, uh, I really do think over the longer term that civics education and media literacy efforts are probably essential to creating uh, voters who are capable over the longer run of rendering uh, prudent uh, electoral judgments. Uh, you know, in the US, there's been a real focus in K through 12 on STEM education, science, uh, mathematics, uh, hard, hard sciences, not civics. In fact, uh, in over half the states, uh, it's possible to graduate from high school without taking a single class in civics. And uh, if you look at polling data, in fact, the uh, senior senator from my home state, who I won't name, was uh, asked about the three branches of government. This is a sitting U.S. senator. And his response is, well, we have the House, we have the Senate, and we have the president. Uh, it says a lot when a sitting member of the U.S. Senate can't even identify the three branches of the federal government. And for the record, it's uh, the executive, the legislative, and the judiciary. The judiciary got kicked to the curb uh, by this fella. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, 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 I've asked my students, I'm not going to name which class, you know, how many representatives are there in the federal house? These are law students, really good law students. Uh, without resorting to Google, they don't know. Uh, and these are, these are people who are a year or two from the bar exam. What does it say about the knowledge of our governing institutions and our uh, uh, our whole project of democratic self-government when very capable law students don't know how many individuals sit in the uh, House of Representatives? Um, so uh, we've got to do better, I think, on civics education, and we've got to do more to make people less trusting. You know, uh, if a student tells me, this is so, and I asked them, well, that seems wrong to me. Where did you find that? And they say, oh, I Googled it and went to Wiki. And like, and why do you think Wiki is necessarily a reliable source of information? And they're like, well, it's on the internet. Uh, and, and so I con concomitant with a lack of civics education is a, th is a lack of sort of what we might call uh, media smarts or media literacy and uh, uh, the need to sort of empower individuals 
to be more skeptical about what they see on Twitter or Instagram or on the web. And again, I, I think this may be something that we have to do when people are 13, 14, 15, rather than 53, 54, 55. I think uh, by the time someone is my age, the ship has probably sailed on both civics education and media literacy. Uh, but I'm very interested and, and hopeful that some of our contributing authors will uh, have ideas and proposals and suggestions for how to harness the power of the community uh, so that we're looking at uh, grassroots up rather than top down kind of solutions uh, to the problems presented by disinformation and misinformation. Uh, I, I suspect that non-governmental organizations and civil society organizations are going to have to be an important part of uh, finding and implementing successful solutions that protect democracy from the uh, worst uh, ill effects of disinfo and misinfo. So in conclusion, it's much easier to identify and describe the problem than to solve it, but the stakes are high uh, and democracy, both here at home and abroad, hang in the balance. Uh, if we're going to maintain uh, our democratic institutions and see them continue to grow and thrive, we've got to do a better job at uh, combating uh, efforts to essentially commit electoral fraud on we the people. Uh, I've talked long enough. I'll cease and desist. And uh, I don't know if we want to have questions uh, now or if we want to hold them until the second talk. I leave that to, to Holly. Sure. Do you guys have any comments that you'd like to share or any questions? I don't have anything from the online participants to, to offer. So if you yes, this is Maureen. She is a lawyer from um, the Republic of Georgia yes. and currently a visiting scholar here at Columbia. Uh, hi uh, to everyone. Very, uh, thank you so much for a very interesting uh, um, speech. Um, I had the one question with regard to your opinion, uh, with regard to the involvement of uh, NGOs uh, and the civil society organizations uh, addressing the disinformation. I absolutely agree, first of all, but I think there could be a, a different opinion, and there are different opinions, and the opponents might have uh, two main points uh, with regard to it. The first one is that, uh, like, uh, at, uh, the work of civil society organizations might be sporadic, and it might not uh, uh, solve the general problem, but rather than just a, a specific cases. So that, and therefore might not be so as much effective as the self-regulation or regulation. And secondly, even if they can, they are effective, the impact will come in a long-term perspective because you talked about a, a lot about the media literacy, about the civic education. And I'm also in favor of those kind of mechanisms, but always when I say this, I hear uh, that it's a long-term goal. So how we should uh, tackle this issue when we have an election, for example, in one year, and you, we want to have a fair election uh, without any disinformation, right? So this is the second one. And you also mentioned uh, like the uh, the um, uh, a role of the religious organizations, for example, but uh, like from the Georgian perspective, sadly, the Orthodox Church, which is one of the very dominant institution in the country is one of the source of disinformation rather than uh, media literacy or anything else. So how, and this is also should be taken into consideration that, that sadly in some communities, uh, those institutions that you are referring, if, if especially religious institutions might not be helpful, but rather than damage those uh, efforts uh, to deal um, um, uh, disinformation. So what would be response to those uh, uh, Argument. Those are great observations, and you're right uh, with respect to uh, NGOs and uh, uh, CSOs being a more long-term. We have to survive for the 16-year-old to be 26 and an active citizen, and if we don't do anything in the short term and our democratic institutions are degraded or even destroyed, then the longer-term efforts won't have the time to actually make things better or, or, or uh, uh, more secure. Uh, so you're right. Uh, I do think that the civil society organizations and non-governmental organizations sort of creating better uh, voters, better informed, more capable voters is not a short or midterm solution. So that would suggest that we're going to have to work 
with respect to government regulation and some form of response involving the media and or the media and the government. So I think all three probably have to be on the table. Uh, with respect to the churches, so this is a really useful uh, comparative law moment because from the U.S., I grew up in Mississippi. And so when I think of churches as civil society organizations, I think of Martin Luther King and Ralph Abernathy and the leaders of the civil rights movement in the Deep South. The civil rights movement in the Deep South was led in large part by the Black church. Uh, and so my paradigm of churches intervening in a community to try to bring around social justice and to ensure uh, uh, compliance with constitutional values are things like the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and the Selma March uh, and, and uh, uh, the work of Dr. King. It had not occurred to me that a church, and but it, it should have, right? Uh, the, 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 the Catholic Church in some countries, take Spain and the Spanish Civil War. Uh, there's an example where a religious organization affiliated itself with forces that were radically anti-democratic. So, uh, I should not blithely assume that all civil society organizations are good. Indeed, if I could conjure uh, some QAnon people or leaders, I suspect they would say we're like the Elks or the VFW or you know the Bowling League. We're just another civil just another civil society organization like any other. So you're right. Uh, I need to be thoughtful and and more nuanced in the way I think about the possibility. You said it more nicely, uh, which I appreciate, but I need to be more thoughtful and nuanced uh, in assuming that civil society organizations will necessarily be working to advance positive democratic values rather than the opposite. I think that's a great point. Uh, they have the capacity to do either. They're not hardwired to do only one. Uh, and since you're from Georgia, how, what are you guys doing with, or what is your government doing with respect to Russian trolls and efforts to disrupt your government? And the government doesn't, any, doesn't do anything. Nothing? No. <laughs> That's not good. They are okay with the <laughs> Russian uh, propaganda. Because my, my sense is Russia is actively trying to disrupt uh, yes. civil society and the government of Georgia through disinformation. Yes, active yes disinformation absolutely. Campaigns. Actually, in our Georgian context, also the, the civil society organizations are the ones who actively work against them. Like we have a lot of fact check organizations, fact checking organizations, organizations working on media literacy and so on. And another problem that your question brings to mind you know, the FBI infiltrated, our, our government intelligence agencies infiltrated CORE and SNCC and the SCLC and, and actually encouraged Dr. King to commit suicide. They, they unlawfully tape recorded conversations. He had private conversations, threatened to send these conversations to his wife, to the mass media, so that uh, the other concern is if you're in a, a society in which government is actively intervening in anti-democratic ways, civil society organizations can also be infiltrated and subverted, uh, which is yet another complicating factor. Well, you've just, you've taken my, my brightest hope and sort of, but no, these, these are great points and, and we have to be clear-eyed and realistic about what is and isn't possible and, and the capacities for reform that each of these modalities presents. So that's a, a great observations and uh, I'll revise the chapter in light of them. I think they're great points. Thank you, Mike. Anybody else? Oh, yes, Sharp. Sure. Yeah, okay, so this was a great framing. Um, I've got, I guess, four, or maybe three and a half comments. Um, one, since you're doing the framing chapter, I'm curious how you're thinking about what counts as misinformation and disinformation, right? Like how broadly you're defining them. Um, I mean, the, you know, you, for good reasons, begin by talking about, you know, January 6th and the, 2016 and 2020 election, but, you know, do you go back to like, you know, if the Brooks Brothers riot, right? Like, would you call that mis or disinformation? Um, and, uh, and, and I ask this in part because as you'll see when I talk about my chapter, I'm thinking sort of really broadly about, um, you know, what might be considered mis or disinformation, including the idea of sort of complete information that comes from kind of a variety of credible sources. Um, I also thought about churches, um, and I'm in fact now wondering if we should have a, if we should find somebody who wants to write about religion and civil society in the third section of the book. Um, you know, I was thinking about the U.S. context, I was thinking about, you know, Black churches, like you mentioned, but also, 
you know, like the evangelical churches in the U.S. are vectors of mis and misinformation um, and um, powerful ones, right? Although the number of people who identify as evangelical is decreasing in the U.S., um, the vote share of evangelical voters is um, stable. Uh, so, so they're powerful. At, they're very good at turning out voters, and that strikes me as, um, you know, <laughs> something we might think about in any number of ways. Um, and then uh, last, um, or sort of last, so you, at the end, you talked about the idea of making people less trusting. And I think that also maybe cuts a couple different ways. I mean, the, I mean, purveyors of misinformation often say like, do your research, right? Like that's one of their main, like don't trust Dr. Fauci, do your own research about, you know, mRNA vaccines. Um, and that leads people down, you know, like internet rabbit holes where they, encounter all sorts of like plausible sounding lies that they then believe are true. And then the sort of ha my half point is like, what, what, if anything, do we do about kind of the stochastic nature of um, myths and disinformation, right? I mean, I think you referred to QAnon as an organization and that is maybe, that maybe suggests more organization and firmer boundaries than they have, right? <laughs> They're, you know, sort of people often anonymous sort of all over the place on the internet, right? And that makes, and that's one of the reasons they're so hard to address. Eduardo. Do you prefer to collect more, Ron, more comments and then answer, or you prefer to answer? Uh, why don't I respond quickly to Charlotte, if that's okay. Yeah. Uh, so great points. Uh, you're right, the chapter is thin on defining it. It's not quite Potter Stewarty. We know it when we see it. I think the definition is limited to a parenthetical that says disinformation is intentionally false information and misinformation uh, is negligently, but in good faith, distributed uh, false information. And you're right. The devil is in the details there in that, uh, you know, uh, Invermectin cures COVID is a pretty easy one to debunk. But we get into claims like, you know, uh, cutting corporate taxes enhances wealth for the working poor. I tend to think that's false, but it's harder to objectively falsify that claim. So I, I do think the capacity for objective falsification uh, should be part of the definition of uh, particularly disinformation. If it can't be objectively falsified, then, you know, sort of leaning in on New York Times company to be Sullivan and the opinion privilege. I, I think people can have opinions that seem kind of uh, far-fetched or, or implausible, but if it's a matter of opinion or belief as opposed to a statement of fact, uh, I'm particularly worried about government efforts to, to sort of uh, extirpate statements of opinion from the, from the marketplace of political ideas. Uh, the point about religion follows up on the first comment. Yes, uh, evangelical churches spread huge amounts of disinformation about vaccines. And in fact, vaccine resistance across the board is associated with uh, certain uh, brands of evangelical Christianity, which is causing outbreaks of things uh, like measles. Uh, uh, it's interesting, actually, that that extremely progressive people and extremely religious people, it's sort of like the John Birchers and the fluoride myth. Uh, uh, the John Birch Society put out in the 60s that adding fluoride to water would cause cancer. There's absolutely whoop, zero uh, scientific evidence, uh, objectively falsifiable. But Portland, Oregon, for example, to this day, does not fluoridate the water because this alliance of the hard left and the hard right came together to block fluoridation, even though all it does is strengthen kids' teeth and reduce the need uh, for uh, for fillings and the prevalence of cavities. So yes, you're right. I, I need to be more nuanced uh, in assuming that all civil society organizations will be uh, agents for truth, good, and justice. They could go either way. They have the capacity to contribute to the solution. They have the capacity to contribute to the problem. That latter point is utterly lacking in the draft, and I'll, I'll uh, build that in. Uh, I do think, nonetheless, that because civil society organizations are self-organized and enjoy trust by their members, that they have a credibility, uh, 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 a surfeit of credibility that the press, at least the traditional press uh, and the government, at least in some societies, might, might not possess. Uh, as for less trusting, you're right. Uh, you know, I didn't talk about this in my principal talk, but... Uh, 
folks like uh, Jerome Barron and Owen Fiss, with respect to government regulation and the traditional media back in the 80s, argued vociferously for right of access to the press and for uh, regulation of the press, particularly dominant press entities, to ensure that they didn't use the accident of ownership to cut off access to ideas and information that were essential to voters rendering prudent electoral judgments. Uh, Fiss's article, Why the State Comes to Mind, for example. And Fiss argues, I think, quite or argues, argued uh, quite cogently that uh, the traditional sort of civil libertarian understanding of government as being the enemy of speech uh, is flawed, erroneous, not accurate. Uh, now, his proposals, along with Jerome Barron's, to uh, regulate the uh, mass media and the print media more aggressively to create uh, opportunities for engagement and to check the use of, of ownership, like we call it the Elon Musk effect, right, with respect to Twitter. Twitter is now Elon Musk's personal First Amendment playground. Uh, didn't really go very far. And I'm not sure our conservative Supreme Court would tolerate uh, rights of access. I think of cases like Miami Herald v. Tornillo. Uh, but uh, I, I think probably you're correct in saying that uh, making voters or encouraging voters to be more reflexively skeptical of government would not necessarily be a good thing, that we may actually need more trust in government in, in the same way that I don't think, and, and you know, I, I'm sure you can Google quickly and find five groups that you know hate the FDA, but I think in general, most people don't want a cancer treatment that hasn't been proven to be safe and effective for the conditions for which it's being uh, uh, prescribed. Uh, and I, I tend to think most people don't like consumer credit fraud, the sorts of things that the FTC uh, works to thwart. Uh, so you're right. Uh, it may be that building greater trust in government institutions is an essential condition for empowering government to undertake regulatory efforts uh, that would, would help correct the marketplace of ideas with respect to intentionally and negligently uh, disseminated falsehoods. Okay, well, well, first of all, thanks Ron to put all this together and to work for having this, this, this book, as you said. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, and, and I have some comments, uh, but I want to start in my comments exactly when in, 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 in the place that you just finished quoting Owen, this, uh, this idea, it came in from Owen and, and, and others about that the government should not be seen as the enemy, but as a the friend of free speech. It's a very powerful idea. I, 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 when I read many, many years ago, the irony of free speech, I said, oh, here is something different of what I have been studying and learning about the role of, 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 of the government. Uh, this book, the idea of this book is to have global ideas and global problems. And it's not only, you know, the focus on, uh, on the vision of a particular uh, part of the world. And let me tell you that the idea of Owen penetrated a lot in Latin America. And that led to the idea of the necessity and sometimes the obligations to regulate mass media and to re regulate the media. And in Latin America, when I heard about regulation of the media, I'm scared because regulation of the media coming from governments that are not very democratic governments or that are not democratic at all, is a real problem. So why I'm starting with that? Because in my intervention, my, what, what I was thinking after hearing you, I quote one of your, 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 your phrases, it says um, that the idea is to look for government interventions that are doing more good than harm. You said exactly that, and I really like that, 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 that sentence. So we need to, 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 to be creative, we need to look for, you know, some interventions that are doing good and not harm. And probably regulation uh, in, in some, uh, depending on how the regulation is proposed and is, is implemented is going, in, in some places, it could do more harm. 
Why I'm saying all of this, and now my idea, and we can discuss that in uh, when, when we discuss my paper that 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 you know what is my idea. in my paper I try uh, to change a little bit the idea or or, or the, the the focus of the problem. So I recognize the problem of misinformation or disinformation. By the way, I included some some ideas coming from Cass Sunstein in Liars about the taxonomy of false expressions mm. that can help a lot in terms of distinguishing mm. misinformation and, 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 and disinformation. But I, I do not diminish the problem. I think that we are we have a problem. I think that we need to do something. But what I'm seeing is a lot of efforts in focusing or I, what I'm seeing is that we are focusing much effort in regulation on media platforms, on regulation and speech, than on thinking what is the origin of all of this. And the origin of all of this is not the messenger, is the one who is creating the false statement that then, you know, is distributed and, and impact in a lot of people. So that's why I try to change a little bit the focus of what we need to do to solve the problem. And what I'm saying in the paper is, why don't we start focusing on the lies or the attitude of public officials, of government uh, officials that uh, not in a negligent way, but on purpose spread lies. And when, what I did is try to focus on different regulations that can, you know, uh, uh, sanction, let's put in this way, public officials or, 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 or governmental officials when they say something that it is not true. Why I am saying this? Because you are working on the introduction of the book and you point out different uh, things on the ideas of what to do. And since I'm, I mean, I, I, I think that maybe it's your chapter, maybe it's also good to include that we have to look not only, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that we have to abandon the idea of how to regulate this problem in media platforms or, or yes, in media platform particularly, but also we need to look at the origin of the problem, which is people that use the media platforms to spread some 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 false statements. So it's it's I'm trying to change a little bit the the focus on 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 the focus on of the problem. Great set of comments, and uh, I uh, sort of follows up on the civil society organizations and churches are not necessarily all good. The point that uh, Owen Fiss's ideas had greater salience and were adopted more widely in Latin America actually does give me pause. In fact, you know, suppose Donald Trump is reelected legitimately as opposed to fake electors and whatnot in 2024. It's a possible outcome. And suppose that courts were in the United States to, to vest government or permit government to regulate uh, the marketplace of political ideas more aggressively to to ferret out, identify, and suppress false speech. Uh, Donald Trump thinks a lot of speech is false speech. He wants New York Times to be Sullivan overruled so that public officials can sue for libel more. Mm -hmm. And when I, I certainly agree with your, your your normative position that intentional propagation of falsehoods by the government by public officials is particularly problematic and corrosive of public trust and the operation of democratic self-government. The problem is coming up with a mechanism uh, that can be reliably uh, operationalized that would identify lies in an even-handed, fair-minded way, uh, as opposed to being weaponized by those who currently hold government power. You know, when you were talking, what came to mind, a sort of thought bubble in my head was, the uh, Sedition Act of 1798, it merely criminalized propagating lies, false information about the uh, government of the United States. Well, technically, the president, the House, and the Senate 
one office was actually excluded. Vice president. Yes. And you know why the vice presidency was excluded? Because it was a guy that Adams didn't like, in initials TJ. That's <laughs> right. Uh, uh, under the original constitution before the 12th Amendment, the runner up in the Electoral College became the vice president. So John Adams, vice president, was his electoral opponent, Thomas Jefferson. And the Sedition Act left a free fire zone on the vice president. Criticize the Veep as much as you want, but don't say anything critical about the House or Senate, which were controlled by the Federalist Party or the president. That's exactly right. Uh, so when I think of the, of, the, of the Sedition Act and the whole concept of seditious libel, I get really nervous. And the normative theory, the Federalists actually had a theory for the Sedition Act, and it was we were elected by the people. And if we are to accomplish the people's business, we can't have our legitimacy and our ability to act undermined by carping by the opposition that makes the people suspicious of us and our motives. So I find the argument a little bizarre, but they actually had a reason for why people should be put in jail for criticizing the government. And uh, David Anderson does a really good job. I'm, I'm forgetting the name of the article. Someone else will probably remember it. Uh, uh, that in the election of 1800, there were five main uh, Democratic, Republican, or Jeffersonian papers, and most other Jeffersonian papers simply republished. They were the UPIAP of the, of the uh, uh, early 19th century. All five editors of those papers were indicted, tried, and convicted of Sedition Act charges. And so the opposition press in the general election of 1800 was essentially silenced. So uh, I certainly think the problem about of, of, of intentional deceit, and after four years of Donald Trump and with the prospect of formal, I mean, lies by the government are a thing in the United States. You know, use bleach, uh, you know, uh, or intermectin cures cancer. Why not try it? I mean, we, we have a president and had an administration in which if his mouth was moving, uh, what was coming out was lies. Uh, and how do you deal with a government or, or Bolsonaro to sort of globalize this a little? My sense is Bolsonaro was cut from the very same cloth as Trump and made the same kinds of claims about COVID, for example, and the effectiveness of Invermectin. How do you how do you correct for the possibility that empowering government to regulate could be weaponized in a way that actually makes the problem of disinfo and misinfo worse? Uh, I don't know. That's not necessarily a rhetorical question. I mean, if you have any, but I, I think maybe the introduction needs to indicate a little more or go in a little more deeply into the, the potential downside of empowering governments to act because, but then on the other hand, I look at Elon Musk uh, or Mark Zuckerberg and I mean, neither is a particularly attractive solution. Letting Elon cut off whomever he wants in the 2024 election, if Twitter remains a, a, a dominant or important modality of democratic discourse, is deeply disturbing. Same thing with Facebook. On the other hand, if you imagine Donald Trump running the Department of Justice uh, or the FTC, I don't know, vesting the federal government with broad regulatory powers to decide what is or isn't true frightens me a lot. So, I mean, it, it seems like we have two bad choices. So, no, I, 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 I agree with you. Um, and I, I, I don't want to open the discussion about my ideas in the paper right now. We have some time in the afternoon. The only thing I would like to, 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 to respond to that is that, first of all, it could sound a little bit contradictory from a person who has been defending freedom of expression and freedom of the press in all of my life, saying now, well, you have some space to curtail freedom of expression of public officials, putting them in, in jail or putting some sanctions. I, I, I said something about that and why it's not a contradiction in, in, in my paper, particularly going to the actual malice doctrine, but it's not on, on, only that. But what you are saying is right. I mean, it, it, it might be difficult to uh, to oper operationalize, to 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 implement the uh, the idea to go against the one who is spreading lie uh, lies of all of false st statements, particularly if it is in the government, it's a powerful people, or so on and so forth. What I'm just saying in my paper, um, and this is the idea, is that in general we are putting a lot of effort 
most of the conference, UNESCO next week is discussing these uh, guidelines to regulate and, uh, and to, to, to regulate platforms and to moderate content. So uh, I just received, and I can read it, another invitation to go to a place where they are going to discuss how to moderate, how to regulate platforms and to, uh, in, in, in moderation. So everybody's talking about that. Nobody, in my view, is talking about that we already have legislation, we already have rules that can be implemented, can be uh, you know, applied to public officials that are lying. And nobody is you know, uh, thinking in, in that tool at the same time of the other tool. And why? Because most of the people that are encouraging the <laughs> platform regulations are people coming from the government. So they are not going to do something that could be a backfire. This is my idea. I'm not saying that we need to stop the other work. I think that the problem is there. I think that we need to do something with you know, the technology, the platform, and, and so on and so forth. I do not know exactly what. I'm always care about regulation of these kind of messengers. But my only point here is, why don't we think also in putting the same efforts in uh, you know, making real the legislation that we already have? It's not only criminal laws, it's administrative law. There are ethical issues and so on and so forth. But we can discuss that when, when, when we discuss the paper. I'll probably move to the next paper too, I think. Oh, well, we have two comments oh, okay. and then John has a question. So I'm having some technical difficulties. I was wondering if maybe Charlotte could help with the webinar chat because I can't read it. Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, great. So <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry here. <laughs> I can do this. So, okay, first, um, there's another point in this argument. Uh, it's more valid in rich countries than in poor countries, considering the general level of education and organization of society. And then the second comment, um, a lot of misinfo and disinformation claims you've discussed are conspiracy theory claims. Conspiracy theories exist and proliferate because of lack of trust in institutions, which is a threat to democracy, as you've discussed. I'd love to better understand how conspiracy theories intersect with this research and welcome your initial thoughts. All right. Uh, on on the, uh, the the first point, uh, uh, I certainly agree that if you lack access to food, shelter, or clothing, you're probably not reading Mitt Romney's position paper on the flat tax. So uh, there's always a kind of duality in talking about engaged citizenship and equal citizenship uh, when uh, we have such di disparate uh positioning of citizens with respect to meeting basic needs uh in fact one of the more attractive aspects of south african jurisprudence that i've run across is this idea of, i think i have it right you can correct me if i'm wrong uh not technical or theoretical equality but substantive equality of citizens exactly, yeah. uh, so that uh it's not enough for the government to make it merely theoretical possible theoretically possible for everyone to vote or everyone to participate in democracy but there's an obligation to create and sustain the conditions that make it possible for all south africans to actually do this substantive equality uh which is a, a concept that's utterly foreign to u.s equal protection uh our supreme court really since the rinquist court has pursued a highly theoretical concept of equality which doesn't take wealth disparity into account at all. So if you theoretically could buy and operate a, a newspaper, then you have the same First Amendment right as anyone else, even if realistically not everyone is Elon Musk and can buy a social media platform to turn it into his own playground. So I, I think those issues are important. Uh, I will revise the chapter uh, to, to sort of uh, at least acknowledge that we're talking about, in some respects, problems that presuppose uh, uh, sufficient access to basic necessities of life that would facilitate engaged participation by most, if not all, uh, citizens. Uh, on the second point, uh, there's a good argument to be made that we could also use this like a social psychologist, uh, as opposed to the, the, the contributors currently consist exclusively of law professors focused on freedom of speech, democracy, and democratic institutions, or, or both. Uh, 
And I'm not clear on, on you almost going to Charlotte's point about a religion, maybe someone who could talk about religious organizations and cults, because in, in some ways, uh, political or quasi-political entities or, or structures like John Birch or, or QAnon are very much akin to high demand religions, right? You sort of get in, uh, you, you are sort of pressured to stay in. Uh, and uh, complete sort of subjugation of the self to the collective seems to be part of what they do, uh, so that there's a lot of groupthink to lean in on another uh, sort of social psychology concept. Uh, I, I certainly think that a better understanding and regulatory policies that take into account these social psychology phenomena would be important to their efficacy. So I appreciate the comment I'm not qualified. I'm not a social psychologist. You know, I did stay at a Holiday Inn joking. No, uh, probably past say that one. Uh, there was a commercial that used to say I'm not a you know an oncologist, but I stayed at a Holiday Inn. Therefore, I can provide treatment in cancer. Uh, but I, I think the point is a good one. And if targeted government regulations don't take into account the realities of social psychology, they're far less likely to be efficacious. So I, I appreciate the second comment as well. Yes, I'll go to John now. Yes, well, uh, thank you very much, Ron. Uh, I just want to make two points that I think are, are connected between them. And the first is that, uh, well, you say in your paper that this is a global problem. Uh, so the, the global problem, uh, although misinformation and disinformation has always existed, uh, the scope of misinformation and disinformation is completely different now. Uh, one of the reasons is that this is global, no? Um, and and the, the way in which the introduction is framed, it looks at like if uh, we are going to look at how uh, national legislations have dealt with these problems in order to find the best solutions that may be applied in the future. But what I don't see, I, I, I'm probably, it, it was me, uh, I read the, the, the introduction uh, quickly yesterday. Uh, I, I didn't see, and I think it's present in some chapters, uh, that there are also uh, global approaches to this problem uh, that, that are, could be basically uh, found in uh, international institutions, human rights. Uh, so I think Eduardo, Eduardo's paper is dealing with that and how the international uh, the, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights ha has dealt with this problem. Uh, at the European level, we're also, we're also having some proposals. So, so I think that um, uh, probably in the introduction or maybe a, a, a section of the, of, of the book uh, would, be, would, be, would, would, uh, would, uh, would, uh, would be good to, 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 to see how this has been tackled at, at an international level. Um, and I think connected to this, uh, to this issue uh, is a second question or, or problem that I identify that uh, even though it is important to see what is happening around the world, I think there are some legislations that are more important than, than others. Huh? Uh, basically, the American one. Oh, it's it's uh, the, the great uh, internet corporations are based in the United States, uh, and they are they are subject to the rules of the United States, no? uh, and they operate globally around the world. Uh, so the rules that are applicable to these companies in other parts of the world are the rules that are in the United States. Uh, so the importance of, of the American legislation to what's happening around the world uh, is, 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 of, is, is extremely, um, uh, I think I will, I will touch upon that in my paper, no? uh, especially for, for democracy, no? because if we think of democracy as, 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 as uh, 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 self-regulation, uh, as, as, as the capacity of the people to decide for themselves the most important issues that affect them, well, uh, in, in a very relevant way now, it is uh, the American legislation that is deciding for many countries how to deal with online communications. So I think that that's something that also probably should be uh, tackled. Both great suggestions. You're right. The introduction doesn't really talk at all or even hat tip toward the UN uh, or the Inter-American Court of Human Rights or the European Court of Human Rights or, or, or the EU. These are... Uh, transnational governmental entities that are attempting to intervene with respect to the problems presented by disinfo and, and misinfo. And they certainly bear uh, mentioning in the framing of, of uh, possible governmental or NGO or both uh, responses. And you're right, they might actually constitute uh, a separate subcategory. I'll have to think about that more carefully with my co-editors. Uh, the point, the second point you make is profoundly depressing. Uh, <laughs> here's why. You're right, with, with, with uh, Alphabet, Google, uh, 
and YouTube, I think, uh, Facebook, Meta, and uh, Twitter all being based in the U.S., uh, their principal regulator is going to be U.S. Now, you know, if 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 Facebook or uh, Amazon or Google operate in France, they're subject to the GDPR and the things like the right to be forgotten. But even if our Congress <clears throat> and, you know, ask yourself what Kevin McCarthy thinks about disinformation and misinformation when, you know, his speakership is contingent on the continuing support of folks like Marjorie Taylor Greene, Lauren Boebert, Paul Gosert, and uh, oh, who's the fun fellow from Florida? Matt Gates. Uh, you know, that, that's his four vote uh, uh, majority at the end of the day. Uh, even if our government could bestir itself, our Congress could bestir itself to pass legislation that would do more good than harm with respect to disinfo and misinfo, I am virtually certain that our Supreme Court would strike it down uh, on the theory that, uh, for example, Google and producing search results is creating speech and that as a speaker, uh, these platforms can't be told what they must or must not publish. There's a case called Miami Herald Tornillo that involved a right of reply statute in Florida, which said if a newspaper endorsed a candidate for a public election or uh, opposed a candidate for a public election, the person whose interests were uh, degraded or, or injured had a right of reply with no less visibility than the newspaper's editorial endorsing the opponent or opposing the candidate. And the court said essentially that it violated the speech and press clauses of the First Amendment to uh, require a newspaper to publish content that it did not wish to publish. Uh, so if you characterize Google or Bing as being engaged in speech, then, or, or Twitter as being engaged in speech, uh, regulation becomes very difficult unless the Supreme Court changes its mind on Tornillo. And I would think Tornillo is probably a buy stock, not a sell stock in terms of the current court. Uh, on the other hand, we, we do have regulation or did have regulation of the phone company and of cable system operators. You all think cable, how quaint. But if you go back 20 years before we have live streaming services like, like uh, Netflix, uh, cable was the prime modality of distributing video content, and most communities had a single cable service provider. So in 1992, Congress passed the Cable Act, and among other things, the Cable Act of 92 required least access to cable systems, uh, as well as authorizing PEG, public educational and governmental channels, as parts of franchise agreements, and limited uh, the number of channel positions that a cable system operator could fill with stations in which they had a financial interest. So there were structural regulations of cable systems because they were seen as a bottleneck to the distribution of, of content. And least access is particularly interesting because a cable system operator essentially had to sell a, can a channel position on its system to any uh, cable station that wanted carriage. And the Supreme Court in the Turner Broadcasting one and two cases sustained the must carry uh, provisions of the Cable Act with respect to terrestrial broadcasters and that, I think, is probably a pretty good signal. And lower courts actually did sustain least access and PEG requirements. So if you were to treat Facebook and Twitter not as speakers, but as platforms or modalities or methods of delivering content, uh, the Cable Act and the regulation of the telephone companies under the Communications Act uh, 34 would provide a predicate for at least uh, common carrier duties which would limit the ability of someone like Elon Musk to say banish Nancy Pelosi from Twitter because he thinks she's mean to him or something. Uh, it's not a perfect solution, but uh, your point about these companies being in the U.S. and the U.S. being the prime regulator is a little spooky because we are global outliers in a big way with respect to our tolerance. Uh, for example, a right to be forgotten would almost certainly be invalid. A general right to be forgotten, particularly as applied to public figures and public officials, no way. Uh, our Supreme Court would, would, would invalidate such a regulation before you could say Jehoshaphat. So if you're looking, or if the solutions require the US take the lead in regulating private social media companies, I fear we're doomed. And on that happy note. <laughs> So now I think we can finally move on. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Paulie. And um, 
thank you, Ron, for bringing us all together and uh, inviting me to contribute a chapter to, to this book. As I indicated per email, my chapter is very much in the making. Um, and Charlotte and I were chatting earlier, saying, when does summer actually end? Because in <laughs> South Africa, it ends in February next year. <laughs> but don't worry, I, I'm with you on the summer. So the same um, for my summer as well. <laughs> so it's always very interesting to to hear you talk of Elon Musk because as many of you may know, Elon Musk is actually South African and was born in, in Pretoria and is probably one of our most famous um famous exports, if you will, probably along with Nelson Mandela from a person perspective. But uh, I'll get to him just now. Right, so what I would really, really appreciate feedback from, from all of you and from the people online is the relationship or the tension, I think, between uh, freedom of expression and its role in protecting and advancing democracy through um, democratic deliverance through uh, democratic pluralism, self-regulation, and aligned to that, the, the very valuable role that we know that the media play when it comes to providing checks and balances on democracies, holding states accountable, and also ensuring that information is made available to, to the people, not only during elections, but generally, and then on the other side, given specifically the African context, and I'll come to that in a moment, how laws should be framed by states to regulate what we're dealing with today, disinformation, misinformation, and uh, what is colloquially known as, as, as false news. So for me, in the African context, we spoke a moment ago about a, um, an educated electorate. This issue is, is, is really important and the tension becomes even more apparent and even more difficult to resolve uh, because of, I would say, you know, sort of the first factor of this, this really um, often uneducated electorate. Um, an electorate who is often voting in South Africa very newly, and, and obviously there are uh, uh, approaches towards voting um, and, and, and the legacy of, of apartheid and racism in South Africa, for example, would influence the electorate as well. And then secondly, a really uh, important point that comes up and which, which I think exacerbates this tension is that we have a number of very fragile young democracies in Africa who, who are recovering from colonization, uh, uh, from, from, from racism, and where even though elections are held regularly, you have a situation where there's often a one-party dominant rule and uh, the media and are often shut down for exposing corruption and the like, but uh, social media is being used as a means to keep that power, because power equals money. Power equals the ability to control the budgets and the money to go to the people who are in government. So there's that issue. The third is that we have a background in Africa, not only in South Africa, but in, in numerous countries in Africa, of oppressive media laws uh, where journalists have been detained under these laws, criminal defamation laws, sedition laws, false news laws, um, where they've been tortured as well, and um, hmm. where the African Commission in its latest declaration on the principles of freedom of expression has specifically called for the need to ensure that such criminal laws are, uh, are, um, are banned, are, are, are not enacted, should be, uh, should they violate the right to freedom of expression. Um, 
And yet, despite the Commission's laudable approach in that regard, in its various principles, not much has changed. And the, the COVID pandemic undoubtedly permitted the entry of new falsehoods. So there's that problem. And then I think the biggest sort of normative issue that, that many of you have mentioned in your papers, and that is how do we deal with, with disinformation and fake news uh, within the wider social political context of what some people call a so-called uh, post-truth error. In other words, what is true? So whilst the paper that I'm writing, the chapter that I'm writing, will consider the legal approach to disinformation. At the same time, I'm really, really interested in how we deal with the normative frames around what is true, uh, what is the purpose of freedom of expression in, 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 in democracies and so on, especially young, fragile democracies with, with, with electorates who are not as sophisticated as they are in the global north. So that is where on those four points and with that big tension that I would I would appreciate input. So then just to, to take it further and, and to deal with, with some of the uh, research that, that I have done is that um, I would start off with, with obviously an overview, dealing with the importance of freedom of, of expression as a precondition for democracy, uh, the implementation of effective system of human rights and so on. And I think many of you have already mentioned this in your chapters, uh, free, vibrant press and media, et cetera. And I'm not going to bore you with all of that again. You know exactly where I'm going. Um, but I think that from an overview perspective that the African and South African treatment of disinformation, misinformation and false news really makes uh, an interesting, fascinating, valuable contribution to this book because it permits analysis of the problem in relation to fragile democracies, young electorates, et cetera, the points that I've already made. And in dealing with this problem is that the reality is that most of the research on the impact on contemporary cases of fake news has focused on the global north. And there are really only a limited number of case studies that have considered the situation in, in the rest of the world. Uh, so even though Donald Trump was credits himself for having coined the term fake news, in actual fact, this reality has existed in the global south and in Africa for many, many years. So we, we know about politicians from, from various African countries, I'll name a few, who've weaponized the concept of fake news through misinformation and disinformation for various purposes. Um, so there's also lots of research on, on, on countries such as Nigeria, Kenya, and Zimbabwe, who have used fake news long before 2016, when Donald Trump um, became involved. So I recognize this reality that, that Africa and, and, and more so than the rest of the global south is an outlier in this respect. And yet, if we were to have a look at the laws of these countries, the, the reality is that they've been around for decades and they are being used. And despite the laudable attempts of the Commission and, and, and the African Human Rights Courts and the regional courts, the sub-regional courts, not much actually gets done. Right, so, so some examples, recent examples, I think might be quite interesting to illustrate the, the African problem on where we're going in the Nigerian elections in 2019. And I think it's really important that a lot of these examples link to elections. And perhaps the one thing that we need to do, and which I intend to do in this chapter, is to, is to interrogate the interface between freedom of expression and election laws and the right to vote and what that means. Somebody did mention it earlier, free and fair elections, because the reality is that in Africa, certainly, false news, disinformation claims happen at the time of elections and for the reasons which I've already mentioned. So in the Nigerian elections of 2019, 
there were social media entrepreneurs who aligned with politicians and they created all sorts of false information and they did so for gain um, and to benefit from their association with politicians. And very often what happens is that there's bribery and corruption going on in the background we'll do this for you, we'll put this information out for you in return once you're re-elected, give us this contract, give us that contract, and so on. And, and you might think that, that this is something that doesn't happen. I can assure you that it happens every single day in Africa. Uh, in my hometown, you can go to a coffee shop, your coffee shop, you will see people entering into corrupt deals. It happens all the time. All right, um, you have to be really, really careful that if you if you if you do business with municipalities, local government, even in a system like South Africa, which is a strong constitution, that you're not being drawn into corruption. So corruption is real, especially at election time. The Kenyan elections uh, in 2017, same story. There's some interesting research that's come out of Kenya is that the impact of disinformation in the Kenyan election found that 90% of Kenyans reported having seen false or inaccurate information during that campaign, with 87% being of the opinion that such disinformation was deliberate. And in that particular poll, 2,000 uh, representative Kenyans were actually polled to get those results. Um, also in Kenya, the disinformation uh, was, was, was designed in such a way to mimic legitimate news content with the badges of media houses like BBC, CNN, and NTV Kenya being misused to attach a credibility to the news in issue. Um, and yeah, what they tried to do was really to, to play to existing beliefs, fears, and biases to sway perceptions and to sway votes. Uh, South Africa, very interesting, I'm sure, I don't know, but probably a lot of you would be aware of the Bell Pottinger scandal, which played out in 2016, and uh, many of you would know that Bell Pottinger is a, a media house based in, in, in the UK, or was based in, in the UK, and along with a, a marketing firm in India, they were part of a long and, and secret campaign to foster racial polarization in South Africa um, and to discredit any critics of the then president, Jacob Zuma, who's currently facing charges for corruption in our courts and who has been exposed in a very, very detailed commission called the Zondo Commission. Zondo is our current chief justice. Uh, of, of corruption um, and through Bell Pottinger, any attempt to, to criticize Zuma and his relationship with a family or Indian family called the Guptas was, was aligned with what was known as white monopoly capital. I don't know if you've heard that term. Um, and you were then accused of being a racist, right? Um, and uh, this, this went on for about a year until eventually it was exposed. And through the state capture, um, it was also used to undermine the then Minister of Finance, Pravin Gordon, who was eventually actually fired and sacked by Zuma and replaced by a puppet Minister of Finance for about a week. So I think it's about 2017, actually, that this, this was the Bell Pottinger scandal was exposed. And, and they obviously shut down. And just recently, I've heard that the campaign to have the directors of Bell Pottinger held personally responsible for this, um, they, they, they've got off the hook. But it, it, the, the damage that it caused in South Africa is, is un, untold. Um, not only insofar as false news is concerned, but also in relation to racial polarization, which 25 years after our democracy began in 1994 remains really a big problem. And I suppose I should disclose that my field is really, I do a lot of work in the regulation of hate and intergroup hate. So I've always been interested in that scandal from that perspective, but here it comes again. 
Um, and, you know, there's, there's other examples uh, in Uganda in January 21. There were also a, a network of inauthentic social media accounts on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, spreading disinformation um, in support of the ruling party. Um, and I can carry on. I mean, Congo, we can go to Sudan, etc. But I really don't think we have time. So what we do know is that in response to some of these um, campaigns, these false news campaigns, disinformation, African governments, despite the African Commission's declaration on freedom of expression, and despite a number of judgments emanating from the African Court on Human and People's Rights and the ECOWAS Court, which is a sub-regional court, still have false news laws in place and have introduced new ones to deal with the phenomenon that I've just, just explained. Um, in South Africa, which I'm going to get to in a moment uh, during the COVID-19 um, uh, uh, disaster management, regulations were passed specifically um, criminalizing false news and their false news laws in, in, in Kenya, Uganda, Zambia, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, with various challenges to them. Excuse me, I'm just gonna have some water. So, so given, given the extent of the problem and given the fact that false news, I'm using the term obviously very generically, laws and criminal definition laws still exist in, in, in African states, um, what then does the, the African human rights um, bodies do to actually regulate freedom of expression or, or to protect freedom of expression and to regulate restrictions? I've, I've mentioned the, the, uh, the principles, the, um, the declaration on the principles of freedom of expression which um, makes a very, very interesting reading and specifically deal with criminalization laws, criminalization of, of, um, of false news, defamation, et cetera, uh, saying that these should be outlawed completely and that the tripartite ICCPR framework that we all know about should be used and that only in very, very grave cases should there be criminalization of, of um, threats to violence, hate speech of the most severe type, et cetera. Uh, the African Charter um, does indeed protect the right to, to freedom of expression. Uh, it also protects the right of, of access uh, to, to information. Um, and I think I don't have enough time to, to deal with how those articles have been interpreted but pretty much in line with what we see in international human rights law uh, globally. Uh, there have indeed been a number of, of interesting uh, decisions coming out of the Commission and the Court on Human and People's Rights, uh, dealing with uh, uh, restrictions to freedom of expression. And these go back to, um, oh, the early 2000s, and um, there's the case of Kenneth e. Good, Kenneth Good versus the Republic of Botswana. Botswana is just north of South Africa and one of my favorite countries, by the way, uh, where um, a person was expelled from Botswana after publishing an academic paper criticizing that government. Um, and the court confirmed the decision of the African Commission in Amnesty International versus Zambia, which is a 2000 decision and the very famous um, European Court of Human Rights decision in Handyside to the effect that freedom of expression was a fundamental human right and necessary for the proper functioning of democracy. And the court, the African court held that in an open and democratic society such as Botswana, and Botswana is indeed, I think one of the really good examples in Africa of an open and democratic and stable society, uh, that dissenting and potential offensive laws must be tolerated and allowed to flourish. And so Botswana was held to have infringed Article 92 of, of the Charter. In another matter, in Zimbabwe, Scanlon and Holderness versus Zimbabwe, 
the complainants alleged that Zimbabwe's access to information protection of privacy act infringed the charter. Uh, journalists had to be accredited before they could um, before they could actually um, publish, and um, the publication of falsehoods was um, also uh, considered, which was an offence in Zimbabwe. And referring to the then principle 11 of the Declaration on Principles of Freedom of Expression, the court held that whilst freedom of expression may be limited by domestic laws aiming at protecting individuals and the public from journalistic practices which deviate from legitimate interests in democracy, these laws must conform to international law standards. So, um, Zimbabwe's contention that the criminalization of falsehoods was justified on the grounds of public order, safety, and the protection of the rights and reputation of others was rejected and was held to be an unjustified restriction of freedom of expression. More recently, in Kanati versus Burkina Faso, which is a probably quite a famous case, um, the applicant was a newspaper editor charged with criminal defamation and with tarnishing the reputation of a prosecutor. He had published articles in which he had accused the prosecutor of FASO of corrupt practices. Um, and he was convicted in Burkina Faso of all charges and sentenced to 12 months imprisonment plus a fine. And there the African court held that Burkina Faso had also violated Article 9 of the Charter, Article 19 of the ICCPR, and Article 66, two, subsection two of the revised Article two of the revised ECOWAS Treaty, because it had in existence national laws which permitted custodial sentences for defamation, and that Burkina Faso had failed to show how a penalty of imprisonment was a necessary limitation to freedom of expression, specifically insofar as freedom of press is concerned. This was held to be a contravention of the line as constituting proportionate interference. In this um, so more, even more recently, uh, 2018, if I'm not mistaken, the ECOWAS court um, held that um, they, 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 they were investigating the violent, um, uh, let me deal with it this way, uh, they decided a case known as the Federation of African Journalists versus the Gambia. And the case was brought by the Federation and the journalists who'd been prosecuted and detained and tortured in custody under the Gambian's harsh press laws for speech critical of the president and government officials. And they, they, they asked for a declaration that the Gambian criminal offenses of sedition false news and defamation in the Gambian criminal code violated the right to freedom of expression uh, in, in the charter, the ICCPR and the ECOWAS treaty. And they succeeded. Um, and the court made it very, very clear that um, these laws interfered with their rights as journalists by instilling fear of potential arrest and prosecution and had a chilling effect on freedom of expression. And What's quite interesting as well is that the court recognized that these laws obviously were not formulated with precision. And in respect to the false news offense, um, the court accepted that errors in journalism are unavoidable. And that if you have criminal liability for, for supposedly false news, uh, this would infringe the, the, the right to, to freedom of expression. So I need to go into a bit more detail on that, but uh, it's interesting to note that the court uh, quoted Sullivan, which I think is a, a US decision, recognizing that an erroneous statement is inevitable in free debate and that it must be protected if the freedom of expression are to have breathing space, they need to survive. And they're placing the burden of proving the truth of a reported statement on the journalist actually deterred freedom of expression very detailed judgment, a, a, a good judgment in, in my view. Um, so, so, so there we have, um, there's been recent cases in Rwanda as well, 2021 um, uh, decision, I think was published that year, where also the Rwandan laws on defamation and freedom of expression were also held 
to violate the African Charter and should be amended. So yeah, that's basically, you know, you've got this really strong African human rights framework undermining what is going on and yet it continues to exist. So I think, you know, it really would be useful to interrogate that, but to also put it alongside the right to vote and what that actually means for the purposes of, of this book. So turning to the South African position, uh, our constitution, I'm not quite sure how much time I have left, Tori. Well, we're at 11.49, but I think we can go till noon. Do you have another 10? Yeah. Certainly, or even a little, we can cut yeah, sure. much a little, I think. Yeah. yeah. I don't want to cut, cut short. Exactly. So the South African position is, is obviously, you know, I, I'm more comfortable with that, and, and I know I'm only, I'm a human rights lawyer. So our constitution protects the right to freedom of expression in, in, in a section 40, section 16, right to freedom of expression, specifically enumerates four types of expression which are listed as being protected. A is freedom of the press and other media. So a lot of work has got to be done on the fact that social media would probably fall into other media, but given Facebook and Twitter's involvement, et cetera, et cetera. How do we deal with that? Okay. Very, very interesting question for South Africa. Um, by the way, you were talking about Facebook and Twitter earlier on, and from the research that I've done in Africa, there's been very little attempts globally to shut down such expression, uh, false expression, electioneering expression on Facebook and Twitter in Africa. So we tend to be the outlier there. But we also protect in section 16, not only freedom of the press and other media, but also the right to receive and impart information and ideas. Okay. And our jurisprudence since the interim constitution and the final constitution have become law has been really pro freedom of expression. Uh, we, the, the courts, have put freedom of expression not as a as as a right of the same value as it is in the US, uh, but have regarded it as being really, really important for the protection of the democracy. So there are only three listed constitutional exceptions to freedom of expression, types of expression that cannot be protected and are not worthy of protection, and they are incitement to imminent violence. Um, the instigation of war, and then hate speech defined in accordance with the ICCPR definition, with only four grounds listed. We also protect um, the right of access to information in our constitution, and on top of that, we also protect the right to, to vote and free and fair elections. And there's been quite a lot of work done on that, but more in relation to having extra political parties on the table and having independent uh, representatives being allowed to stand. In South Africa, if you want to limit the right to freedom of expression through domestic laws, national laws, you either need to fit them very, very tightly into the three exclusions or alternatively such uh, restrictions have to be justified in terms of section 36, which is our limitation clause. And that is very much designed um, in accordance with the uh, Canadian Charter, with the German Grundnorm, and the courts would uh, adopt obviously a, a balancing of proportionality approach, taking into account the nature of the right, the nature and extent of the limitation, its purpose. Uh, rationality and less restrictive means. Okay, so in recent years, any attempts to undermine press freedom and media freedom have been challenged by very strong NGOs protecting the right to freedom of expression in South Africa, such as, for example, the Freedom of Expression Institute, uh, the Editors Forum, South African National Editors Forum, and so on. There's a number of them. Also, um, organizations working at universities are protecting journalists. 
um, and they have actively, actively uh, sought to uh, challenge laws which regulate freedom of expression, and they've largely been successful. Um, so, for example, when the Forms and Publications Act was amended in about 2016, 2017, the press was successful in arguing that that act, which actually uh, replaced uh, our very, very horrible um, uh, laws under apartheid to regulate forms and publications, but the court held, the constitutional court held that that act was unconstitutional and needed to be granted because it placed too much, uh, too many restrictions on, on the media. So we also have an electoral act, electoral laws, and it's in fact in, in, in the very famous case of the DA versus the ANC, the DA stands for the Democratic Alliance, which is the official opposition to the ANC, which is the ruling party, that a false news law was challenged, right? And that happened, I think if I'm not mistaken, I'll have to go back, but in about 2018 or so, perhaps a bit earlier, no, 2016, sorry. And I'm going to come to that in a moment uh, and have a look at how the court dealt with an SMS that was sent out by a political party in terms of uh, electoral laws. But we also recently have a new Cyber Crimes Act, which was passed in 2020. Strangely, that Cyber Crimes Act, and maybe happily, does not deal with false news in any great detail at all. You could maybe fit it into sort of malicious communications type uh, offenses, but these actually are more designed at incitement of violence, damage to property, and so on. There's no specific false news law in, in South Africa in the Cyber Crimes Act of 2020. So that brings me back then to, to the electoral laws and to the uh, DA versus ANC case, which, which I have now open. And uh, section 89, subsection one and two uh, of that particular act, the electoral act reads as follows. No person when required in terms of this act to make a statement, may make the statement A, knowing that it is false, or B, without believing on reasonable grounds that the statement is true, and then two, which was the one that was relevant in this case of DA versus ANC, no person may publish any false information with the intention of A, disrupting or preventing an election, B, creating hostility or fear in order to influence the conduct or outcome of an election, or C, and this one's very broad, influencing the conduct or outcome of an election. So just to read that on its own, no person may publish any false information with the intention of C, influencing the conduct or outcome of an election. So this provision was interpreted and tested actually per Zondo J in, in the case of uh, DA versus ANC. And the case is interesting because the DA put out an SMS basically the day after the then public protectors report came out to show that uh, in building his residence at Khan, like you might've heard of that, uh, President Zuma had, had stolen money. And the DA put out an SMS which said, the, the public protector's report shows how Zuma has stolen your money to build his residence. Um, vote DA, we stand up against corruption or whatever it might be. And they did it the day after that report came out. Unfortunately, the report at that stage did not, it was only the public protector's report, did not officially name or, or, or show that Zuma himself had stolen the money, all right? And so the ANC objected to this on the basis that this was a false statement of fact. The report did not actually show that Zuma himself had stolen the money uh, for his house at Nkanda. And um, the ANC actually landed up winning this particular case because the constitutional court held that the defense of fair comment would not be allowed to, uh, could not be used 
and that the information was indeed false because whilst the report might have hinted at it, it was not true. And uh, the result was that the DA had to retract this particular um, uh, SMS. And that's really the only constitutional court decision that we have dealing with this. So despite a long story about the need to protect press freedom, et cetera, et cetera, and free and fair elections, we have uh, the DA losing, um, but on an issue which it turned out later on was absolutely true. I mean, he did steal money. There's absolutely no doubt about it. The state capture report has shown that in 2023. But the case only deals with political party vis-a-vis -vis political party. We haven't had a situation where other people have been involved with false information. So that still needs to get tested. And the Electoral Act also obviously doesn't deal with, with things online. So, so that also still needs to get contested. As I said, the Cyber Crimes Act is pretty much silent on all of this. But I, 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 th I really think that if this law in relation to the need to balance free and fair elections with freedom of expression had to be tested in relation to <laughs> false information, there would be a need to really interrogate what is meant by false information, mm -hmm. false statements, false facts. The court tried to use defamation laws in ANC versus DA to do that. And I think that's where you get sidetracked, actually. Because you can't use defamation laws. That's protecting a person's reputation, honor, et cetera, to do it. We need to here really balance, as I said, the right to vote, free and fair elections with the right to freedom of expression. And not only vis-a-vis -vis political parties, but also in relation to other actors become involved. And how we would then also regulate platforms such as Facebook, Twitter, and so on. So whilst I sound like I, I may be rambling, I don't, I don't think I am, but, but maybe. But, but I think the, the point is, is that South Africa really does provide a very, very... <coughs> fascinating uh, jurisdiction in light of the African framework to try and grapple with what we're dealing with today. And you mentioned a moment ago uh, the right to substantive equality. And uh, Ron and I had a long discussion also about constitutional values when he was in South Africa, and I haven't even gone there today. But the reality is that the right to substantive equality has actually never, ever been used in relation to these issues. So that, that's something that I, I've noted. And, and I think there would probably be a reliance more on, on 19, which is the right to vote and, and freedom of expression and, and balancing up free and fair versus the right to freedom of expression and looking at the rationality of the law, the purpose of the law, et cetera, and trying to arrive at an outcome. We, by the way, still have criminal defamation laws. They actually have been used last, I think, in 2010 in the case of Ho Ho, who was a guy who thought he was being very funny. Ironically, his surname was Ho Ho. But South Africa is really an outlier in other African countries because if you if you look at other African countries, there's so many attempts to undermine journalists. So that's what I have to offer. And I really would, as I said, I think appreciate input from you on how we would, not only from the South African perspective, but overall in the African context, in light of the four points I mentioned right at the beginning, try and balance the need to ensure that voters are not misinformed and the need to protect people's right to engage in the debate. Can false information ever amount to democratic deliverance? Search for the truth. Those are the ideas that I want to break with. So thank you. There we go. We have some questions here. Okay, Eduardo. Thank you, Joanna, for your presentation. It's very inspiring for my own paper as well, because at the very end, you start talking about the electoral laws. Yeah. And this is something exactly of what I included in my in my paper. And I in saying okay, why don't we enforce the electoral laws that we already have when a candidate is, you know, 
knowingly lying and spreading false news. So the, 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 I, I mean, I, I think that it is very useful not to think only on criminal laws and criminal defamation specifically, but in other sectors of yeah. the law that can also apply to this problem. And electoral laws is 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 one of those. So my, I, I would like to know more about the decision of of the Supreme Court, you know, the Constitutional Court or yeah. the Supreme Court is the Constitution, Constitution the Constitutional yeah. Court in, in 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 South Africa. So this is not a. I mean, I, I am. I, I'm also glad that you raised the the issue about you know banning criminal law in cases of defamation and all the jurisprudence in South Africa and in Africa in general coming from the African Commission and the African Court. The, the African declaration is very similar of what we have in the inter-American system. And I, when I was, sorry for the self-reference, but when I was special rapporteur at the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights, I was advocating and sometimes I succeed in, on the decriminalization of defamation in many countries in, in Latin America. Because in our region and in your region, criminal law is the problem. Yeah. It's a very big problem, yeah. but that doesn't mean. And the last uh, we have a, a last decision coming from the Inter American Court, the Barahona versus Chile decision. You can talk better than me about that, but it's it's very clear that in our in our region for the Inter American system, the 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 criminalization of expressions that are related to public interest, to put in a very broad way, is not align with the inter-American standards. Yes. But that doesn't mean that they don't have consequences mm -hmm. because the inter-American court, the inter-American commission, including the declaration, opened the, the door to include civil sanctions or civil damages. Of course, that could be more problematic. We have some cases on that because sometimes the, 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 the I mean, the, the real problem behind all of that is self-censorship. Yeah. We used to use criminal law to <laughs> create an environment for self-censorship and not to criticize the government. Then people in public official or powerful people understand that this is not the way because they are going to look to lost all of their their, 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 their their cases. So they start using civil defamation instead of criminal defamation. And we have some decision about civil defamation. But what I want to say here is that it's not, I mean, Advocating for the use of criminal law is not the only solution, and it's not the solution. But we have spaces in legislation at all, in administrative law, in electoral laws, that we can apply to this problem as well. This is part of my paper as well, but I'm very glad that you raised the point about electoral, uh, the, the, the how to enforce in some way the electoral. And finally, it's very interesting for me of what you say about the what's the cyber, cyber crimes act. The cyber crime act that did not include anything about false statement. Probably include a lot about regulation of 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 of, mis, of, of spreading misery, but nothing about there's actually not much on the the uh there's there's no specific criminal offense created. I'm I, I'm glad to hear that. that which but is good news. But, but it's a lot. It was a long fight. I can okay, because, because electoral laws, in my research, I put it there, have sanctions. For example, to a political party that is spreading false news. For example, the government or the state can stop, you know, providing them for funds that are obliged to provide by the law. So there are a lot of space to work there as well. And I'm glad to that you include. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for your comments, if I may just respond. Yes. Um, absolutely, I agree with you. So I'm not an advocate for criminalization, let me put it there, mm -hmm. when, where, where freedom of expression is concerned. And I think that freedom, uh, that, that, that criminalization must be a last resort, absolutely, mm -hmm. and very, very tightly defined. The intersection between uh, the use of uh, the criminal law versus the civil law, and there would include the Electoral Act and human rights law for this type of uh, situation, I think is also something that we, we need to explore in, in, in more detail. Mm -hmm. um, interestingly, um, 
next month in May, I'm in Geneva and we're working on the, uh, the standards to Article 4 of the I code and the criminalization of racial hate speech. Mm. And specifically on the agenda is, is how we will be advocating as a group of experts to, to look at civil sanctions, in fact, promotional measures to deal with racial hatred and other forms of hatred. Um, but yeah, it seems to be, I think, on the continent that almost the, the false news paradigm coming out of the states has given the impetus to some African states to, to, to use their criminal law, uh, existing criminal laws. As the to, solution. To, yeah, 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 that's the way to go, you know, and, and, and look what's happening in the states. I mean, they are a, they're a very, very established democracy, a strong democracy. So you know, why can't we? I mean, it's even worse here, you know. So yeah, it's, it's a very interesting thing. And the Electoral Act, I think, are one with that very broad number C that I mentioned earlier on will need reworking to deal with the, um, the new uh, form of electoral misinformation that we see in there, not only from political parties, but also from, from other uh, organizations of people who are out to seek gain for, for, for spreading um, information that they know is false. But again, you know, you've got also the government mistrust and you know, all this sort of stuff that you've got to try and balance up. So thank you. Yeah. Does anybody else have any questions or comments at this point? I had a question. That's okay. Sure. So I actually have four. You can I'll email them to you too. Uh, thank but, you. Uh, respond or not as you think best. It sounds like you're describing a very serious political economy problem in South Africa and Africa more generally. Yeah. So is the the corruption that you mentioned uh, yes. and the use of disinformation to retain power. Yeah. So is the government a, a major source of the problem then in the region rather than a source of solutions? And are the courts perhaps uh, sufficiently empowered and independent to serve as engines of change through, say, common law or reading statutes up or down in a way that uh, might check these self-serving impulses by the government? Uh, second, uh, how good or reliable is compliance by domestic governments with decisions premised on the African Charter? It sounds like those decisions are great. But I'm wondering if compliance, uh, incorporating them into domestic law is comparable, for example, with compliance by uh, Council of Europe states and European Court of Human Rights decisions. I'm just not familiar with the track record of implementation. Uh, third, uh, how did the South African COVID disinfo, misinfo law actually work out? Was it merely precatory or were there charges brought and successfully prosecuted for false information about vaccines, vaccine side effects, efficacy. And fourth and finally, uh, I'm fascinated by and horrified by deep fakes using misattributed media sourcing like the BBC. Mm -hmm. That's just, I'd never even thought of that. Are any remedies available uh, or pathways to correction available? Do media companies utilize these pathways and to what end or good effect? I just, it never occurred to me that you could deep fake a New York Times or CNN story. If that's happening in the US, I'm not very familiar with it, but just horrified. Uh, and I'm wondering what media companies are doing to protect their brand integrity and brand uh, image. So those are my, my four questions. We have two more questions. Should we take all the questions and then we can answer and then uh, kind of pick up afterwards for? Would you mind if I take those sure. four because there were four and okay. I'm worried that I'm going to, to sure. lose track of that and then the next slide. So corruption, the courts, legislation, let me talk to, to the South African position. South African Constitution 665 specifically tells the courts that they are duty bound to uphold the constitution and the, and the courts have actually been the uh, the power that have upheld human rights and the integrity of the constitution in South Africa. A lot of people would say that for the first time in, in South Africa, it's actually great to be a lawyer because it's the lawyers and the courts and NGOs who fight for the protection of human rights um, who have ensured that our constitution uh, filters down. A big issue, of course, is question of socioeconomic rights in a country such as South Africa and also other African countries. 
because of this huge divide between in the have and the have nots. So what's also happening is that you've got a lot of uh, mistrust or distrust in a constitution which promises socioeconomic rights or access to socioeconomic rights. And yet, uh, 25 years after democracy, you've got a situation where we still, according to the Gini coefficient, uh, the, the richest and the poorest in, in the world. So there's that tension between the constitution actually uh, at one very well-known South African university, um, there are there's a school of thought which is teaching that the constitution is in fact part of the so-called white bloc, that it's actually a sellout of African rights and it should therefore um, be amended, which of course it can be amended because no constitution is final. Um, and that um, what was done under Nelson Mandela's time and done through the constitutional court is really just the protection of sort of you know, um, liberal rights and, and an undermining of, of socioeconomic rights of people. And so you have this huge tension, I think, in a country such as South Africa between the courts who have the authority and the mandate to enforce the constitution and government who's been held to account by the court. So what you're seeing with state capture, for example, which has been huge in our country, and the Zondo Commission cost millions and millions and millions, all right, is a result of the courts ordering that to take place. And so but for the courts, I think uh, government as a whole would be in, in, in really big trouble. So I can speak then to the courts definitely holding uh, the executive and the legislature to account in a country such as South Africa. Uh, in other African countries, there, there, there is some hope as well. Other African countries also have strong courts, but in the countries such as Zimbabwe, for example, you just put into, into, into the courts the puppets of who you want. So, so that's a huge problem. Countries like uh, Kenya, Zambia, et cetera, much, much stronger. Um, Corruption, I don't even want to start. I mean, we've had on our TV, corruption, corruption, corruption. That is the reality. ESCOM, I don't know if you know, with like load shedding, you were there recently. At the moment, we're on something called stage six load shedding, which basically means that every two hours, you've got no power. Yeah, okay? it's cut off in Joburg. I'm yeah, shocked. this gets cut off. Cape Town too. And um, we all have uh, inverters in our home, which give us battery power. But apparently the result, that is caused by the fact that government has got so many connections to coal power that it wants to retain coal power and it controls ESCOM. So then comes the climate change issue as well, of course. So uh, it's huge, right? Issue number two um, was... Decisions in compliance into domestic law. Um, Implementation of African yeah. Carter decisions. Yeah. I think it's reactionary is the problem. So, so what would happen is, is that um, you, you, you're you ordered uh, to, to amend your laws. There are amendments that might take place. But the system that you've seen in EU is, is nowhere, nowhere implemented in Africa to that extent. You know, so it's very much sort of an, on an ad hoc reactionary type basis and where the torture has happened after the fact. It's something that I definitely also need to explore further. The COVID laws was your third issue. So the, the laws regulating false information relating to uh, the government's attempt to fix COVID-19 uh, in South Africa and to implement vaccinations, um, et cetera. Um, was actually a regulation, which is a subordinate law under the disaster management law. And that law could only be triggered once the government actually declared a disaster. So first of all, it's got to declare a disaster, which then gives it the authority to pass these regulations. That regulation was passed uh, without going through parliament because a regulation can be passed without going through government. And there's lots of challenges now at the use of disaster management to, to, um, to implement quick fixes through regulations and also to undermine administrative law in relation to procurement. So government has learned that the COVID-19 pandemic and you know, the protection of the common good, et cetera, very good excuse to undermine our very, very strong administrative laws and so on. 
And so we've had a number of new disasters being declared post COVID-19, such as following terrible uh, floods in, in, in KwaZulu-Natal region, and also an attempt to declare the electricity crisis as a disaster, which would then open up the door, which is very, very worrying, mm -hmm. very worrying. But at the moment, that regulation's gone. It, it doesn't exist. Um, yeah, um, using BBC and the like to, to make false stories, it's common. It happens regularly. And can you tell them easily? I mean, is it really bad deep fake or is it it's, it's, non-transparent? It's, it, 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 it varies from bad to, to pretty good. You know, I mean, I have a mother, for example, who's probably one of the most susceptible gullible people I've ever known and who loves social media. And she just ping, share another story. And her mom, I mean, that is so obviously false. <laughs> but I mean, she's educated, you know. So you have to bear in mind that education in Africa um, and socioeconomic rights education fits in there is, is, is a big problem on top of that. Uh, you need to bear in mind that in Africa, the cost of data is incredibly expensive, hugely, hugely expensive. I, I paid $5 for an incredible amount of data, which at home would have cost me a thousand rand. So now you don't have money. We actually give our students data as part of their package because they need that to be able to access stuff out of varsity. It is control that's controlled by government. So you've got an uneducated populace throughout Africa. Go and have a look at the competition laws on data, on, 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 on Wi-Fi, you name it. And you've got a populace who, you know, um, it's fairly computer savvy, but can also easily be influenced by this type of thing because of the, the inability to, to really see the wood for the trees. So yeah, it happens regularly. There's many examples of it. I hope I've answered your question. You did, thank you. Okay, we have two more questions. Um, yeah. Who would like to go, to go okay. first, John? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Joanna, very much. Uh, I think it's, it's very interesting to, to, to tackle the question uh, through electoral laws. Yes. That's very illuminating because it's, it's, it's I, think, I, think, I think that's, that's uh, the, the basic uh, plays where, 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 where misinformation and disinformation are relevant. Uh, Regulate. I have a general question and, and then a comment. Uh, the general question is about libel, because you said that in the constitution, the limits to freedom of speech. Libel defamation, in other words, yeah. Yeah, yeah limits are, are very reduced to incitement of violence, war, and hate speech. How, how does libel fit within this uh, scheme? Uh, and at the same time, I, I would like to ask if, uh, if this information and misinformation has been uh, a way approach through libel. Uh, so, uh, fake speech uh, that harms someone's reputation. Uh, if there is any jurisprudence uh, on that, uh, how, how does it deal? And then the the, um, the comment, because you were you were asking um, uh, comments about uh, the relationship between free speech and truth. Mm -hmm. And I, I would I, I would think, you know, that, uh, well, if we speak about this information and misinformation, at the other side is truth. You no, know? so it's 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 common to to fall into one or the other. So if you if you reject uh, this information or misinformation, then well, you are defending defending freedom of speech as as a, as, a, as a way of of, of achieving truth. Uh, and I don't think uh, it is necessary to, to put uh, both uh, things in in the same in the same picture. Mm -hmm. I think it's dangerous. Um, uh, so because. First of all, you know the the, the doctrine of, of of the marketplace of ideas, mm -hmm. of free speech as a, as an instrument to to, to obtain the truth. Uh, well, it's it's a very old uh, you know theory since Milton, yeah, uh, John Stuart yeah. Mill, then in the United States, uh, 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 Holmes, you know, with the marketplace yeah. of ideas. But all the, what they have in common, all these theories, is that they have um, they have uh, in a way uh, opposed uh, to. Uh, governmental regulation or to restrictions to freedom of speech. Uh, uh, so they say, you know, when government wants to, uh, uh, to, 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 to obtain the truth, uh, they regulate. Uh, and, and the problem of regulation is that, you know, there is censorship and so on. Uh, so so um, uh, the truth, uh, when it's accompanied by, by free speech, means always more speech. Uh, yeah. 
So if we're if we're dealing here with with mechanism or governmental mechanisms in a way to to to, to tackle misinformation and disinformation, uh, we don't want that. You know, we don't want uh, uh, the opposite. You know, the response that only more speech will bring the truth. Uh, uh, so I don't think the search for truth uh, should be the, the the main thing here. I think we should move. Uh, because the search for truth is the most ambitious uh, of all goals, you know, is, yeah. uh, we're not going to find the truth. Uh, we just want to take from the public sphere uh, this information and misinformation, which is much um, a much more um, uh, less ambitious goal. Uh, so that was just a comment. So I, I, I think I think that speaking about truth is is very problematic. Yeah. Uh, Thanks. That's useful. Um, should we answer that or Andres? Did you have a, a question? No, I... Uh, one, one, one last question. Thank you very much for a very informative presentation. I'm a historian, so I'm wondering, keeping in mind, Winston Churchill was there during the Boer War, oh. and then there was, of course, the colonial British rule, then there was apartheid, then there was uh, the CODESA, right? The, the, the yes. group CODESA that yeah. uh, put. And if you can comment on the history of freedom of speech in South Africa between these two, uh, between several different periods. Right. I didn't include that actually, so I'll take that first uh, because of time constraints. But um, if one one traces it back, in fact, during the uh, the uh, Boer War, there's there's so the Boer War was between the the Afrikaans uh, nationalists in in South Africa and and the English, the English having uh, colonized uh, South Africa, and the Dutch also having been in South Africa. And um, so there was the use of so-called false news uh, at that level to depict the Boers as these um, terrible people who, who uh, would, would burn property, would uh, take your land, were, were almost like barbarians, if you will, um, and to attract uh, British uh, soldiers to come out to South Africa to fight the Boer War against uh, against the the Boers, and I mean incredible atrocities were actually performed uh, took place during during the Boer War. And ironically, I mean I'm of English descent, and my husband, a surname, it is Afrikaans, and um, I'm afraid that Boerta was also the surname of P. W. Boerta, who was the rather infamous president of South Africa during apartheid, and. Uh, I can tell you that the English were definitely no angels in, in, in the Boer War and burned concentration camps and, and the like. So, so misinformation, disinformation in South Africa, if you trace it back historically, would have started round about the Boer War, and I'm sure it went back much, much earlier as well. Um, then uh, during, during apartheid, as we know, uh, when 1948, um, the press and the media were shut down completely. Um, there were the most uh, draconian laws passed to undermine freedom of expression. And it is for this reason that in South Africa that our courts have not put freedom of expression on a pedestal because our constitution treats all rights equally, but has stressed that the, the media is incredibly important, journalists are incredibly important in ensuring that the truth will out um, and that there will be more importantly uh, a proper democracy to protect the democracy and to 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 uh, display and to reveal instances of of corruption. Okay, so during apartheid, um, there there was undoubtedly um, um, shutting down of the press. I mean, there were days when the press just had black pages. Um, because they were not allowed to report. Uh, journalists had to be registered. So if you were anti-government, uh, you would not actually have got a license to publish in those days. Yeah. Um, what did you say, Steve Biko? Biko. Yeah, well, Biko was killed, killed in, a, in, in, in a police station, um, probably two blocks from where I grew up, <laughs> uh, to put it out there, you know. So, uh, and, uh, and and what was also done was to... to um, uh, and but for the, for the, the work of people like Helen Suzman and so on, to um, not reveal to the South African people the extent to which what was going on, what was happening in, in jails and, and the like. 
I mean, if you protested against it um, when I was at varsity, uh, you went to jail. I mean, I, I remember taking jail pa exam papers to people in jail during my final year law exams. Um, a guy who was part of the students. So, so it was really, really posh. Um, there are lots more instances of false information coming out of the South African situation. That's why with the Bell uh, Pottinger thing going on in 2016, it's it's really ironic because you have this Boer War on the one side and Bell Pottinger on the other, you know. And um, so we go. I mean, and then you've also got people going out there saying that there's the so-called white genocide happening in South Africa, which uh, I'm really worried about with claims like that because, you know, is that a consequence of hate or is it a consequence of socioeconomic conditions? Um, yeah, I don't know if there's any more detail you want on that history. No. For well, now, okay. <laughs> so, all right, let me go to yeah, the electoral laws. I think in Africa is the way to go because we know that one of the main purposes of freedom of expression is obviously to promote democracy. How do we achieve a democracy? How do we ensure that we, we have a multi-party democracy, it's, it's through elections. So we need to have a system in place which promotes democracy through law, which would be the electoral laws. And I think it, it, it definitely makes sense to, to, to link the power relations here um, to, to the electoral laws and, and to deal with it at that level as opposed to the criminalization. That was the first point. The second point was, okay, libel. So we call it defamation. And defamation in South Africa is actually part of our common law. Our common law is Roman Dutch, so defamation, farmer, meaning reputation. And most of the common law of defamation in South Africa is civil. Uh, we do have a, a common law crime of criminal defamation. Um, I told you about the case of Ho Ho, where the Supreme Court of Appeal held that it was still in existence. That was in 2010. I don't know of any other case in South Africa where that's happened, and they're meant to be passing a law outlawing it, but they just haven't got there. Uh, so we mainly use civil defamation, and it's used a lot. The problem is it's really expensive to litigate in, in South Africa. Um, and uh, it has been used um, in relation to, to, to Twitter, Facebook, and the like. There's, there's numerous cases where people have liked and have been held to contribute towards a publication of a false statement. So reform is needed there as well. But because the civil law is so expensive to use, a lot of people would refrain from going there. We do have um, equality laws, uh, which would also help you. We have protection from harassment laws, which are civil, which would also help you. Uh, and you would normally find most people would go that away. But those courts are also not really strange. So, so yeah, there's some interesting cases happening happening there and then I think um that was it that, that you asked me yeah I, yeah thanks well thank you all this has been absolutely fascinating incredibly rich discussion this morning but it's time for the lunch break so um we've run a little over should we say we'll reconvene at uh 1 15 so for everybody online, thank you for staying with us. Thank you for your continued interest. And um, if you have time, come back at 1.15 and we will restart for the afternoon panels. Thanks again. Yeah. Uh, of the free press, uh, dealing with mainly the theoretical issues of press freedom, it was really a, a pleasure to read. Uh, and I'm just also happy to to share the information with you that John also contributes to another edited collection uh, I'm, I'm working on at the moment. Uh, you already submitted a piece on, on Chilean press freedom and press regulation. Uh, so it's very active. Um, he's a well known uh, scholar worldwide. So John, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Andros, for that generous introduction. Um, I would also like to thank Ron uh, for inviting me to form part of this great group of scholars uh, and for organizing this, this event. Um, Holly, I will also want to thank you and the Global Freedom of Expression. Uh, is it a center uh, program? It is um, an initiative, initiative, is what we call it. Okay. Yes. 
uh, <laughs> for hosting us here. Uh, it's really great to be here. Um, the title of uh, my presentation, which is also the title of the chapter, at least uh, tentative, is the deconstitutionalization of free speech in the age of disinformation and misinformation. Uh, Ron asked me to, to, to talk about the case of Chile. Uh, so this uh, work deals basically with, with, with Chile. But um, I would like to start by some, saying something that uh, already uh, Andras uh, already introduced. Uh, in relation to, to, to some of my interests in relation to free speech, um, which are, have been uh, in an important part theoretical interests. Um, so um, uh, the, the book that uh, Andras mentioned has a chapter that, that, that deals with, with the meaning of freedom, with the concept of freedom, uh, to understand what uh, free speech means. Uh, and what are the different meanings of free speech depending on uh, what do we understand by freedom? Uh, so in that book, basically, there are two conceptions of freedom that are at play. Uh, both are negative conceptions of freedom, uh, freedom as non-interference or freedom uh, as non-coercion, which is, which is the, the, the basic liberal approach. Uh, and, and then freedom as non-domination, uh, which is uh, a Republican approach. Uh, and depending on, on what, how, how do we uh, define freedom, uh, there are many consequences uh, in the way we understand freedom of speech and in the way we regulate things related to free speech. So when I start looking at, at uh, what's going on in Chile with, uh, with this information and this information, I, I thought that this would be a nice approach, by, but I uh, very quickly realized uh, that the problems are much more uh, serious than just uh, dealing with these nuances between, between freedom, of freedom as non-interference -inter or freedom as non-domination, because I realized that here there is a problem with a, with a basic uh, political freedom, uh, positive freedom, uh, the freedom of the people to decide for themselves uh, what are the basic rules uh, that uh, regulate uh, the most important things you now of a society. In this case, uh, what are the basic rules that, uh, that define the way in which communications happen in the public sphere? Uh, so um, I will try to, 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 to um, yeah, I, 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 will, I will try to, ex to show you know, uh, what is the problem basically in relation to political freedom. Yeah. So this is basically a chapter uh, that deals uh, with misinformation and uh, disinformation uh, from a legal perspective, just as Joanna uh, is, was dealing as well, yeah. Um, and uh, there are two basic questions uh, that are you can see there in the in the in the in the in, uh, in the how you call the screen. Um, one question is uh, related to the first two concepts of the book. Uh, so, how does the legal order respond to the phenomenon of uh, disinformation and misinformation? And the second question is related to the third concept, which is democracy, uh, because the question of who defines uh, the rules of online communication uh, is a question that uh, it's uh, uh, implicated uh, with self-government. Mm -hmm. So if, if, if the people, uh, if, 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 if the sovereign uh, is the one uh, that defines for himself or itself uh, these basic rules, then we can we can predicate of it that it is it's democratic. No? Uh, if it doesn't, well, we have a political problem. Uh, and that's the political problem that I will expose in this in this chapter. Um, I say that the the case of Chile um, maybe is not very interesting uh, uh, in in terms of rules uh, that deal with misinformation and disinformation, but I think it's interesting in another way um, uh, because there are some particularities for the case of Chile uh, that let us see. Uh, how two different uh, types of government have dealt historically uh, with disinformation. Uh, there is in Chile a political transition that goes uh, back to, to the dictatorship of Pinochet in the 70s and the 80s. And there is a particular way of dealing with disinformation uh, that goes up uh, to the constitution. And then we have a, a political transition to democracy. <laughs> And we will see that uh, uh, even though in democracy, uh, the rules that were drafted during the dictatorship in relation to disinformation were taken off the system, 
um, even though that happened, you know, as I was as I was uh, already um, uh, introducing, you no, know, there are rules that are coming basically from the United States, uh, uh, Section two hundred thirty of the Communication Decency Act, and it's finally the one that uh, defines uh, online communication applies now to Chile. So the paradox is that even if we are in a democracy, uh, the regulation of of this information uh, in the last forty years has, has never been something that has been in charge of the people, uh, even though we are in a democracy. So how how I will present uh, this this thesis, which is the basic thesis of the of the chapter. Uh, first, I will I will look at uh, this information in the constitutional crisis. We had a constitutional crisis that started back in 2019 um, with uh, very strong uh, riots and manifestations. Uh, and we're still in this constitutional crisis. Currently, the next week, there is going to be an election uh, where we will choose uh, the representatives of the convention uh, that is going to draft a new constitution, which we are going to vote by the end of the year. So we are in the middle of a constitutional crisis. Mm -hmm. And, and there are issues of disinformation that have uh, occurred during the crisis. After looking at that, I will try to answer the first question. So how does the legal order respond to the phenomenon of disinformation? And I will, it's going to be like a historical uh, path. So I will look at what happened during the dictatorship and what's going on now uh, in uh, the democratic system. And I will look at basically two, um, two uh, structures, the constitutional structure and the legal structure. Um, and then I will I will um, comment very shortly uh, on how the public sphere has been radically transformed as a consequence uh, of technical developments, uh, and how those uh, transformations has basically affected the rules, uh, the legal order, uh, uh, the, the the rights uh, and duties uh, that uh, are applicable to those who participate in the formation of public opinion. Mm -hmm. Uh, and finally, I will see the effects that those transformations have uh, in the constitutional order. Uh, that's why the paper is called Deconstitutionalization of Free Speech, because basically uh, these transformations have uh, left the rules uh, designed in the constitution in relation to free speech without application, at least on what, what, what is related to online communications. Well, so... You have here uh, an amazing picture uh, taken by a, how you call these uh, helicopters, little drone, drone, yeah. drone exactly, uh, by a drone. Uh, this, I assume that it's in October, 2019, um, where after the government decided to increase by 30, ce 30 cents, 30 pesos, which is equivalent in the United States to 30 cents, the price of public transport, uh, students began to jump the turn turnstiles in the in the in the subway, um, and that was a very mediatic uh, thing, uh, which produced a very quick expansion of protests and manifestations, uh, with a lot of violence involved. Uh, and in weeks, uh, the president, the former president Sebastián Piñera, uh, decided to to decree a state of emergency, a uh, state of exception. Sorry. Uh, and, and curfews uh, were imposed in different regions of the country. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> finally, this, this produced a constitutional reform that activated a constitutional process. Um, maybe you know, but uh, this constitutional process was a failure in the first stage. A convention was, uh, was uh, commanded with the duty to uh, draft the constitution. Uh, they did that, and the constitution was rejected last September uh, by 65% of the population. Um, during the protests um, and during the election, uh, there were issues involved with this information. Huh? There was basically a, a feeling of confusion in the country. No? Uh, confusion was first um, the consequence of, uh, of, you know, Huge manifestation that no one, nobody was expecting. I was talking to Ron in the in the while we were having lunch. You know that this picture that, that, that uh, there is of Chile, you no, know, like being an exception uh, within within Latin America. Well, President, former President Pineda said exactly that uh, one week before uh, the whole thing started. Uh, he said Chile is an uh, is an oasis within the region. Uh, there is there is uh, economic growth. Uh, there is uh, social mobility. Uh, uh, whereas in the region, uh, there is economic stagnation and, and, and huge social problems. Well, one week after that, 
uh, we had uh, these huge strikes and that ended up with a, with a, with a, with a constitutional process. More than 30 people were killed. Uh, um, uh, uh, very, a lot of people had uh, eye injuries uh, uh, and, and, and several public and private buildings were destroyed. 25 uh, subway stations were completely burned. So there was confusion. Uh, there was confusion. Nobody saw this coming in the first place. Uh, in the second place, uh, there was this mixture of very pacific and very strong manifestations. I think the most popular manifestations since the recover of democracy, maybe the most popular ma manifestations in Chilean history. You can see there is more than one million people gathering in the center of Santiago. Um, and at the same time, there was this information that it was fed uh, by uh, social media. Mm -hmm. Uh, there were lies, uh, strict lies, uh, coming from both sides of the political spectrum, uh, while the left was uh, generally um, uh, showing lies or producing lies uh, in relation to violence uh, and in relation to distractions. There was one that they say that the, the, there was a hospital, a children's hospital in Santiago that was completely burned. Information was reproduced by the, by the, by the health secretary, uh, which was completely a lie. Uh, they were accusing uh, the, the, the progressive coalition Frente Amplio uh, of building up a program where they were going to defect the president and build uh, uh, new institutions, complete lie. Uh, but there were also lies coming from, uh, from, from, from the left wing uh, movements uh, that were uh, always looking at um, uh, or, 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 or uh, creating uh, stories about police repression. Uh, they said among other things that, that uh, there was a, there was a torture center uh, in one of the subway stations and so on. Uh, also, there were problems uh, during the election. The election of the of the where where, where the convention where, where the convention presented the the, the constitution. Uh, strict lies about what the constitution proposed uh, that there was no property right, which was straight lie, and it was disseminated. And uh, there there are some polls that say that it had effects in in the in the in the result of the election. Um, lies about that the constitution uh, accepted abortion uh, up to six months uh, and so on. So there, there were problems, there were issues with, with this information. I wouldn't say that those issues were as grave as the ones uh, in this country, um, uh, but, but I think the, 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 this is evidence that there is something building up and that in any time uh, we can have electoral uh, issues related to this information. So that's basically what happened. Uh, during that time, and now I would like to to to, to show you know, what what has been uh, the way in which the the constitutional the legal system has reacted uh, to this information. Uh, that's the figure of Pinochet uh, 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 back in the seventies, and here there is a quote uh, of uh, the communication secretary of Pinochet uh, in nineteen eighty eight. Uh, this is a lecture that he gave in Universidad de Chile for the inauguration of the academic year. Um, and he says, it is not risky to say that it is difficult to find another nation in the world that has had to face with greater persistence a campaign of disinformation such as the one has Chile has suffered. It is therefore interesting to reflect on the reasons that have led to the planning and maintenance of a real system aimed at disorientating, sowing doubt and suspicion, hiding the truth and conditioning the reaction of national and world opinion. This is now, this is, I think, this is a very common um, approach of authoritarian uh, governments or di dictatorships towards information that uh, they 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 take as uh, misinformation or disinformation, and as a consequence, uh, the the regime took very seriously uh, the the regulation of this information. So here I copied uh, Article 19, Number Four, uh, which is in the Constitution or was in the Constitution. Uh, in the constitution that was uh, imposed during the dictatorship. Um, Article 19 is the, the, the Bill of Rights and number four protects or protected uh, the, uh, the, the private and public life of individuals uh, and their reputation. Mm -hmm. So any infringement, that's what is quoted, any infringement of this precept committed through mass media and consisting of the imputation of a false fact or act or one that unjustifiably ca causes harm or discredit to a person or their family shall constitute a criminal offense. Right? This is very interesting because you know usually criminal offenses uh, against reputation they're you know in South Africa part of the common law no? yeah. uh, and and in Chile they, they there is a, the legal system deals with this. But what what is incredible here is that this was put in the constitution itself. No. Um, 
And if you read that, uh, I, I was I was looking at Eduardo's paper. Uh, one can see that you know, any there, there is there is there is no uh, in, uh, in, if you measure this against the international standards, it is completely out uh, of of any any uh, reasonable uh, approach to free speech or the free press. Huh? Um, and this was, of course, uh, this was, of course, uh, intentional. No? Uh, the, 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 the dictatorship uh, wanted to protect itself from the media. Uh, and here I quoted another, another uh, a former president of Chile who participated in the drafting of Pinochet's constitution. It's Jorge Alessandri, uh, which refers to this norm in 1978 uh, when he says that the concept of freedom of the press as it emanated from the postulates of the French Revolution is today obsolete and its validity is incompatible with the government of peoples and public tranquility. Uh, that was basically you know, the, the, the position uh, of the dictatorship um, uh, in relation to the media. Mm -hmm. So um, what happened then? Um, we, we had a political transition uh, that was conducted through the constitution of Pinochet uh, and in 1990, uh, we transited from uh, the dictatorship to a democracy. So that's a very important picture. It's the day of the inauguration uh, of the first democratic uh, president after Pinochet, which is Patricio Elwin on your left side. Uh, and Pinochet is giving the band, uh, the presidential band, which, which is the, which, which is the, the, the way the, the formal, no, no worries. The, you know, the, the formal act that happens when when the when the president is uh, inaugurated uh, i think the, the did we lose it uh, i'm sorry i was trying to fix a technical problem my apologies no worries let me um try one more time to get us back to where we were if i can continue uh so um what what is interesting now is uh that this rule that was established in the constitution uh, article 19 number 4 uh, which which uh, establishes the offense of, of of defamation as the way it was called uh, remained in the constitution until 2005 so it was 15 years of democracy uh, in which you know this rule was completely tolerated uh, there are many political explanations for this, uh, but it's still incredible from a free speech perspective. No, um, um, in two thousand five, during uh, the government of of uh, Ricardo Lagos, the first socialist president uh, after Salvador Allende, uh, there was a huge uh, amendment of the constitution uh, in which all the authoritarian parts of the constitution, or many of them, were removed, including including this rule on on uh, defamation. Uh, but what I was saying at the beginning, even though we transit from um, a dictatorship uh, to a democracy, uh, uh, the democratic paradox uh, is that in a democracy, it has not been the people themselves that have given uh, the rules of, uh, of online communications, but this, again, has been the decision uh, of third parties. Uh, we will see that this has been uh, through the transform transformation of the public sphere uh, due to the technological progress uh, in which the rules that are applicable are the rules uh, applicable to these huge companies, Facebook, Internet, Twitter, which are all based in the United States. No? Um, so how can we explain this? Um, I first, I will look first at the uh, at, uh, what are the basic rules of the, of, the, of the democratic order in Chile. Then I will look very, uh, very, very shortly to the technical transformations to see then how those transformations have impacted the legal order. So let's see the rules in Chile. Um, first of all, um, free speech, of course, it is, uh, it is, it is, a, it is a, a fundamental right, uh, a, a constitutional right, uh, and it is defined uh, as uh, the right of any person to freely expose opinions uh, and to inform the public. Mm -hmm. That's the basic right. Now, this right, uh, the, it has a straightforward prohibition against, against uh, previous censorship. Uh, so uh, that doesn't mean that this is an absolute right. Uh, uh, it means that uh, through expressions or through speech, uh, a person uh, trespasses the limits of free speech, then it has to respond. No? Uh, 
uh, and we will see what, how that responsibility is uh, is 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 uh, established. So, um, what is very important uh, is that any limit to free speech must be necessarily configured by law. It's the the, the you call it principio de reserva legal. Uh, you call it the, the principle of legality. Principle of legality. Yeah. I don't think there is there is a, there is an equivalent in the United States. No. Uh, I've heard that it's it's similar. It's but you cannot. It's similar to the non-delegation clause, um, but basically this means that only uh, the 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 limits of freedom of speech can be built by 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 the parliament. No, and that's a guarantee. Uh, it's a guarantee because uh, free speech is so important that these sorts of decisions might, might need to be made by by the by the most representative organ uh, through norms that are general and abstract, so they prevent uh, arbitrariness. No, that's. A basic principle of the rule of law within the Chilean constitutional system. Mm -hmm. The First Amendment is, it says, yeah, it's exactly. no law. Exactly. So it's, 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 it's the other way around. Yeah. Way. yeah. And then um, we have another principle that it's uh, that it's not in the American system at all, uh, which is that uh, freedom of speech might be limited by the protection of other constitutional rights. Mm -hmm. huh? So in Chile, uh, in Chile, um, there is the horizontal effect. Uh, which means which means that uh, the constitutional rights are not only directed against the state, uh, but against any person, institution, or group. Mm -hmm. And this is very important uh, because uh, every organization, institution, or group uh, needs to respect uh, constitutional rights. Mm -hmm. Among among those rights uh, is the right to reputation. Huh? So uh, it, this basically means that uh, at a constitutional level. Freedom of speech can collide uh, with reputation, and there are actions, and the courts can deal uh, directly using the constitution to solve these conflicts. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not a, this is not the case at all uh, in the United States. Uh, I'm just pointing out these principles because they're important, uh, because then we will see that these principles, in a way, have disappeared uh, uh, throughout time. Then the constitution has a number of normative guarantees uh, uh, that they protect. Uh, fundamental rights, not as subjective rights, but as uh, as objective norms. Mm -hmm. uh, which are those? Uh, first of all, the protection of the essential content. Uh, this is German influence, um, which means that if a free speech is limited by the legislature, uh, the law can never uh, affect the essential content of free speech. Mm -hmm. Uh, so what happens if it does? Then we have a judicial review. No, the, who the, defines the essential content? Uh, who, who says what the essential content is? Nobody. Or, no, nobody. That's a problem. Like, uh, that's defines doctrinal. what sorry, Ron? the essential content of the right. That's a doctrinal uh, issue. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> who gets to decide whether the essential content has been affected or not? the constitutional court uh, through judicial review uh, and this is very, it's it's you know before the law uh, enters into force uh, uh, the constitutional court can uh, check uh, in this case if there is uh, an affection of the uh, essential content and declare the law inconstitutional so it won't get into the system mm -hmm. uh, there is a third normative guarantee uh, which is related to the special quorums that are required uh, for a law that establishes uh, restrictions to freedom of speech, uh, which is a law that it's 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 above the 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 the, the normal majority. Okay, so that that talks about the importance that the constitution gives to free speech. And then there is also in the constitution a right to rectification. Uh, Ron was talking in his presentation about uh, the problems of rectification. Um, uh, so so if a person uh, has been injured uh, by by a publication in any media. Uh, it has the right the, to 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 get a rectification in the same terms by the media that that committed the offense. Those are basic principles in the constitution. And then uh, we have the law. Mm -hmm. um, the dis disinformation, uh, disinformation, um, even though it is not directly regulated in the press act, uh, there are still some norms that could be applied. Um, uh, and basically, those are uh, libel uh, norms, uh, defamation. Uh, so, so the only way in Chile now, after after the dictatorship, uh, that uh, uh, eventually um, uh, misinformation or disinformation uh, could be um, could be could be um, uh, um, 
legally um, approached uh, is if uh, uh, a piece of information which is false uh, produces a harm on someone's reputation. Uh, only in that case, then uh, a person a person could uh, defend his reputation at the same time uh, 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 direct against the people uh, the person that that has uh, uh, that has produced uh, this information. Uh, now, the, the system uh, or the rules uh, that are applicable in the case uh, that, this, uh, that, that, that this information has been produced through the media are different from the rules that apply in the criminal, uh, in, in the criminal uh, code. Huh? Basically, basically uh, the media has more exemption, more defenses uh, against, against uh, libel laws, and that's Again, uh, an explanation related to the importance that the system provides uh, to a free press. So what are the, are the defenses? Basically, defenses that uh, allow uh, the media to show the truth of its claim. Mm -hmm. uh, and if in the criminal code, uh, a person can only defend himself, proving the truth of a statement against a libel action are uh, uh, reduced to public officials, uh, which are um, uh, are accused in relation to their public duties, uh, the exemption or the defense here is bigger uh, and includes not only the exercise of public functions, but also proceedings that with the consent of the interest party have been captured by the media. It includes professional trade of real public interest or crime and misdemeanors. Okay, so this is basically the way in which the media can defend himself against libel. Right? This, what we are talking about, the, the opposite between misinformation and disinformation, truth, uh, the importance that the system gives to truth is basically through this defense. Uh, in, the, in, the, in, in, in the United Kingdom, they call this defense the defense of justification. Okay, um, so basically all these rules, uh, at least in what is related to online communication, uh, have lost its strength. Uh, and the, and the, 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 the cause of this, uh, is related to the technical transformation of the public sphere, uh, the transition from analog to digital. Um, following Jack Balkin, uh, I say that the communication regulation during uh, the uh, analog public sphere can be characterized as a dyadic model. Uh, dyadic, mo dyadic is the way which you pronounce. Yeah. yeah. Didactic. Didactic. Uh, so basically, basically there are two principal actors. Uh, on the one hand, you have the state. On the other hand, you have speakers and publishers. Mm -hmm. uh, the law basically prevents the state from interfering unduly uh, with freedom of speech. Uh, but at the same time, the law regulates uh, or establishes limits uh, to free speech uh, in order to prevent the free speech uh, violates or affects other rights uh, or liberties. No? Um, so in this system, in this system, basically, it's the courts uh, which are called to decide uh, whether um, whether the the, the uh, there has been an infringement of free speech or not. No, dyadic system. What happens in the digital public sphere? It's not di di dyadic anymore. It's a pluralist model because within in between the state uh, and the speakers or the publishers uh, emerge a third important group. Uh, uh, the intermediaries, uh, which are not publishers, they don't produce their own contents, uh, but they usually tend to um, uh, upload or to or to or to or to publish someone else's content. And this is very important uh, for liability, you know, because uh, if intermediaries are not directly the ones that produce the content, then they are not directly liable for the contents that are uploaded in their pages. Mm -hmm. Other other. Uh, issues uh, such as instantaneousness of communications, uh, such as the transnational flow of information, such as anonymity, uh, people just publish uh, without giving their names, and the use of artif artificial intelligence has made much more difficult for the state uh, to control uh, the communications online. So basically, two great models uh, have emerged from this problem, uh, the European model, uh, which uh, Andras will talk, so I will not talk about it, and it doesn't have too much effect uh, in the Chilean system. And then the American model uh, that is basically framed through Section 230 
of communications this is the act uh, in in very general terms i think what what how much time do i have i'm, I'm finishing okay yeah, yeah it's, 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 yeah, few minutes, yeah. yeah okay I will, I will i will go through this uh, uh, quickly so basically 200 uh, section 230 communications decency act uh, provides uh, a wide range of immunity uh, for intermediaries uh, in relation to contents that have been uploaded in their systems that are illegal. Uh, but at the same time, that's not the only thing. Uh, uh, Section 2 or Part 2 of Section 230 uh, provides also a, a lot of uh, freedom uh, for intermediaries uh, to decide uh, on moderation policies and what sorts of contents could be uh, taken out from the system. No? Any action voluntary taken in good faith to restrict access to or availability of material that the provider or user considers to be obscene, lead, lascivious, filthy, excessively violent, harassing, or other objectionable, whether or not such material is constitutionally protected. Eh? So basically, uh, the huge intermediaries uh, have a lot of power. Mm? They have a, a lot of power to define the sorts of communications that may that, 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 that may be produced in the digital uh, public sphere and the problem uh, the problem of this is basically uh, that uh, these uh, huge uh, internet companies uh, have become i think this expression was 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 given by by kate clonic uh, the new governors uh, the new governors of online communications uh, so national governments uh, in many ways uh, are not able to control uh, the speech that is produced in these intermediaries, in these huge companies, uh, and many of the rules that are nationally designed in order to deal with problems such as misinformation and disinformation or uh, other limits to freedom of speech uh, cannot be dealt with because, because uh, uh, in a way, countries do not have jurisprudence to attack uh, these companies. What happens in Chile and how can we explain that finally it is uh, Section 230, the immunity of intermediaries, uh, the rule that is prevalent in relation to online communications. Uh, basically, the the press act, uh, the press act that le leads with the media, has a general clause uh, to define what the media is. I think Joanna also uh, pointed out this problem. No, uh, what is the media uh, for the purpose of defining if they are responsible for the duties uh, and obligations that are stated in the press act? Uh, is something that uh, you know it's not clear. It's not clear. This act uh, comes from 2001, uh, when uh, there was no there was no uh, possible way of foreseeing uh, what will happen uh, in online communications. Um, but basically, the courts um, um, have applied a, a principle of editorial responsibility. So, um, if they find that uh, an, uh, uh, an, uh, uh, an internet company uh, has certain control over the contents that are uploaded, uh, it may find uh, that it is liable uh, for breaches of free speech. Uh, and, and, uh, but generally, the, the courts have been very ambiguous about it. Uh, uh, at some points, they have said that uh, intermediaries are media for the purpose of the law, but they, can, they cannot direct, uh, they, can, they cannot uh, held those intermediaries liable because they're outside the borders of the country. Um, so basically, basically uh, the rules that are contained in section 230 are not applicable. Mm -hmm. um, but what is more serious, uh, and what uh, I will, I, I haven't, uh, this, is, this, is, this, this research is in an initial phase, uh, and I will dig more on this, uh, which, is, which is the effect uh, that, uh, that this has on uh, the constitutional principles. Uh, such as the horizontal effect. These companies are not liable, they're not responsible uh, for any breach, not only of free speech, but any other rights that uh, eventually may be affected. Um, the, the principle of legality. No? Uh, so who gets to define what are the limits of free speech? No? Uh, it is not the law. Uh, it is basically uh, the same intermediaries that define what are uh, the rules that apply to online communications. Yeah? And uh, uh, the more that online uh, uh, companies, internet companies, uh, get to moderate content and define the rules of that moderation and sanction uh, persons that are involved in those communications, uh, the less the national system has uh, can deal with, with, with these problems. So it's the principle of legality, it's the horizontal effect, and basically also the capacity of a court eventually to judge 
uh, if those rules uh, are uh, within the uh, requirements of the constitution or not. So I will leave it That's wonderful. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. And you have showed extraordinary grace under pressure with all the technical difficulties. <laughs> Thank you for going with the flow. And um, I'm gonna try to fix that when we get to um, Andres right now. So I'm going to now change the screen. Would anybody like to ask a question while I do the technical switcheroo? Okay. <laughs> Eduardo, I saw your hand first. Yeah, I actually, it's more, thank you for the presentation, very interesting. I like the, the title also on how you're going to work on, it, on that title. A couple of comments uh, or invitation. First of all, uh, Section 230, and my colleagues from the US can better talk about that, is under fire now. I mean, it's a, some people want to repeal Section 230 and to change Section 230. There is a case pending, pending to the U.S. Supreme Court. So because this is a working paper, try to, you know, be aware of that because it could change dramatically the situation here in the U.S. And I think that is not going to continue inspiring other legislation, on the contrary. And I am very... I have a lot of concerns about what's going on here with Section 230. The second one and the second invitation is to, I'm not saying include, but to mention, or yes, include something about how the Inter-American System of Human Rights collaborates or, 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 yeah, or influence it in some reforms in Chile as well. Because you, you say many times, okay, we need to you know, define some kind of concepts and so on and so forth. The last case this, that I, I, I mentioned this, this morning, Chile has many cases that uh, from the Inter-American Court of Human Rights saying that the freedom of expression has been violated. Most of them is because of insult laws, defamation laws, and so on. So. Uh, and, and, and the Inter-American Court didn't mandate specifically to change the, well, yes, in the last one, they, they say that they had, Chile has to change the insult laws, the, the criminal defamation laws, because the concept is too vague and can affect freedom of expression. So my invitation is to include something, I mean, at least in footnotes, how the Inter-American system is constructing or deconstructing uh, what you call a uh, constitutional freedom of uh, expression, freedom of press. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, please, Joanna. Yeah, thank you very much, John. It's a very, very interesting presentation. And um, it would seem to me, um, I found the, your slide with the three basic principles that, under, that underline constitutionality very, very interesting. Um, and also the use of, it would seem, libel or defamation laws to control or regulate disinformation or, or, or misinformation. And I now understand the question that you, yeah. that you posed to me. Um, so what's interesting is that libel or, or, or defamation, as I understand it, and, and, you, and you hinted at this, is is a, a remedy which is you know goes back years and years and years, but it's designed to protect the reputation of a person or a trading organization, whatever yeah. political party perhaps. Um, and yet when we deal with uh, disinformation and the spread of false news and we link it to a democracy and the protection of a democracy, I find it it would be a stretch, I think, yeah. know, maybe through um, some rather elaborate uh, jurisprudential gymnastics to to link disinformation to to reputation and to to libel. So I'm I'm wondering how that would happen in the Chilean uh, context. Would there be a need, for example, to introduce new laws that that deal with this situation? Could you use the existing libel laws in in a way to try and frame the phenomena that we see now. Um, and then also very interesting, uh, your discussion on horizontality. Um, so the South African constitution also has horizontal effect. We also have a specific provision 
that permits horizontal application of the uh, of the rights in the Bill of Rights. And we've seen quite a lot of decent jurisprudence recently on, on holding private actors um, accountable for rights abuses, but even in, in, in the sphere of socioeconomic rights, which is, which is really interesting. Um, so not only in relation to respecting each other's right, but also having a duty to promote and to fulfill uh, uh, um, somebody else's rights. And I think an interesting take might be, um, and I'm refer referring this to you and to me, is to say, well, if you have a constitution which permits horizontality, surely that can be used then to, to and, and you mentioned obviously the vertical effect between the speaker and, and the government is to bring in the issue of intermediaries there in more detail and use the horizontal provisions to hold them accountable for the um, undermining of, of a democracy, for example. But if, if the laws are liable laws, how on earth do you do that? Is this really um, um, I hope that makes some sense. Well, thank you very much, Joanna. Those are very uh, useful and interesting comments. Um, the first one, um, yeah, I would say definitely no, libel is not the way to deal with misinformation and disinformation. Right? Libel is, 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 is an institution that it's a uh, uh, purpose, of which is, is the protection of reputation. Yeah. And so um, it, it's, it's, it's not at all connected. Right? So even, even, even in, in the, 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 in the, com in the, in the, in the criminal code, uh, it says that uh, it is irrelevant uh, for uh, for for the purpose of of, of, of an action of a libel action, uh, if what uh, the the defendant said was true or not, you know? uh, if it's a falsity uh, or if it's true, it doesn't matter because what matters if it if it affects uh, someone's reputation. Uh, but um, but that's the only way that a at, 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 at this point, I see uh, that could that, that could be dealt with this with the with the, 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 the problem of, of disinformation and misinformation because it's certain there, there's there's certain cases uh, in which uh, the the affection the the, the, the violation of reputation uh, could go together with uh, disinformation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think what's going on now with Donald Trump is 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 it's through libel, no? Um, the 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 what a uh, uh, with the journalist, yeah, 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 yeah. It's uh, that, that, yeah, it's through level, yeah. I think, I th yeah. So it's 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 like in, like an indirect way, you know, of dealing with 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 this information. And here, I think what 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 appears uh, uh, and what 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 help helps explain why, uh, even though they're completely unconnected, uh, one can see uh, a way of going through this way uh, is the defense of justification, mm -hmm. uh, because truth is involved. Mm -hmm. yeah. When things are very important, uh, when, when it is a public official uh, and things are related to its public duties, uh, then uh, the media uh, can defend itself from, from a libel action uh, saying that this is true. Mm -hmm. So the system, then the, the courts have to decide whether, the, whether this is true or not. It's very difficult uh, because it is, it is the defendant that has to prove the truth. Uh, and that, that's enormous uh, uh, you know, in, in implication, uh, difficulty. You know? Uh, and in, in in the case of the media, the the, the defense is expanded uh, because uh, there are not only issues that are involved with public officials and their duties, but other issues that are, are also of public interest. But it's still very limited. Uh, it's limited uh, first because this is criminalized, as Eduardo was saying, no, uh, which which produces a chilling effect, mm -hmm. uh, a chilling effect on the media. Uh, and at the same time, it's limited because because the the defense of justification is very difficult to prove us at the same time, no. Uh, <laughs> But there is no other way. You know, there is no regulation of this information. So only only through this uh, very uh, very narrow uh, uh, institution, uh, I can see a way of, of, of doing it. But it is not even applicable uh, in the case of online communications because there is no way uh, to go after uh, these huge companies. They are outside the jurisdiction, uh, and the the, 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 the the rules the rules are not applicable. And then, yeah, in relation to the horizontal effect. Um, there are, you know, it's there because the, the horizontal effect 
uh, has to do not with libel, mm -hmm. uh, but has to do with constitutional rights. Yeah. Uh, uh, so libel is at the legal level. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the horizontal effects means uh, that not only the state, but any person, group, or institution uh, need to comply with the with the with the with the duties uh, related to human rights. Uh, so that means that eventually uh, a, a, a private uh, can be prosecuted mm -hmm. using only constitutional rules in order to make the case. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not libel. Uh, it's 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 still you know the constitution protects reputation. Uh, so you can go you can go through the constitution, which which is a very basic rule of the protection of reputation, uh, to go against uh, a company, to go against an individual, uh, if um, if that individual, if that company uh, has uh, breached uh, fundamental rights. Um, so I think, yeah, in 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 the, in the case in the case uh, of the United States, where there is no horizontal effect. Uh, the way in which these companies deal, for example, with the moderation uh, of communications uh, uh, is not relevant at a constitutional level. Uh, but for us, it is very relevant because they are responsible uh, for human rights. No? Yeah. Uh, and if they breach those human rights, then those breaches are not applicable to our system. I don't know if I explain myself. Yeah, you, you absolutely do. If I may just come in as a, as, a, as a quick response to that, I think that is where horizontality can be used in relation to moderation in systems such as yours yeah. and also ours. But just on, on, on the issue of, of libel and defamation, to me, it, it, it seems as if we're using the wrong box, if you will, to regulate a modern problem. It's like using defamation to fight hate, the spread of hate, because it's quite simply just a different thing. And um, you know, it's not just a labeling problem, it's it's an understanding the basis of the actual regulation. I wanted to add on to your comment and, and amplify it. So I think what Joanna's talking about is collective harm, social harm, yeah. mm -hmm. whereas libel defamation is aimed at the person whose personal injury or economic interests are harmed by false speech. Yeah. And <clears throat> libel and defamation don't really provide either a procedural mechanism or a remedial scheme to counter the social harms associated right. with disinfo and misinfo. And there are collective action problems that would work as well, even if they did, because everyone is harmed a little bit, but not enough to justify lawyering up and going into court. So uh, is libel defamation actually a useful or a desirable way of framing this with respect to the collective or social harms? You said the constitution failed, and, or the proposed new constitution failed because of disinfo and misinfo in part. I mean, how do you, how do you stop that from happening again? And, and in your view, did the Constitution fail in part because of misunderstandings that were propagated through, through disinformation or misinformation media campaigns? I mean, that's a pretty high social cost if that's true. And if I may add something in the same line of what Ron and, and Joanna said, not all false statements are defamatory. Okay. <laughs> yeah. and so, if, so maybe libel law could be could be something related to this problem but in a, for some specific group of expressions but not for all the problem of misinformation because there are a lot of false statements for example this i the, this the, the statement coming from former president trump saying if you drink bleach was bleach i mean it's good for fighting covid this is not defamatory, has a lot of social impact, but it's not a defamatory uh, statement. At least maybe it's defamatory for me because he thinks that I am stupid, but <laughs> this is another problem. I mean. <laughs> yeah. so, so just, sorry, John, just, just take that, 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 that further on, on, on collective harm, which is exactly where I was trying to go. Thank you, Ron. Um, just take that a step back and say, well, then why do we protect freedom of expression? Because we know we protect it to, to advance the individual, right? You know, you go the autonomy, all that sort of route. And we've taken truth and we said that's the most sort of highfalutin aim of freedom of expression. Defamation, of course, brings the truth into it because of the truth defenses. So there you go to the truth again. But if you see it, if you see this type of law as one that's protecting democracy, a common good, uh, a collective good, so to speak, then you don't need to worry about um, these sort of individual aspects, if you will, of freedom of expression and the truth aspects. 
and instead you focus on on freedom of expression as being a social good, as as promoting this overall democratic deliberation and talk and 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 seeing it not as a as a as a libertarian freedom, but you started with what's freedom, right? But seeing it more as a collective freedom that actually advances an overall good, just just my ideas. Yeah, yeah. well, I can't agree with all of you more uh, about the, the fact that libel is, is not the way going for now. Uh, but uh, this, the Chilean system is a system that uh, doesn't deal with misinformation and disinformation. Yeah. So if you look at the system, uh, the only way, uh, which, which is not uh, the direct, that's why I'm saying this is not a, a direct regulation of misinformation and disinformation. This is just going you know, uh, round, round the, the, the road. You know? uh, but if I agree with Eduardo completely, you know, there is not always coincidence uh, between disinformation and misinformation and libel. You know? uh, there can be uh, information that it's completely true. That, that's why you, know, it's, you can say the truth about something and saying the truth uh, would be would be would be liable uh, because because it, it it harms someone's reputation someone's um so yeah this is not the way but this is the only way that actually exists in chile uh, and and that's why I, I was looking at this and about the you know yeah the collective you no know, that's freedom of speech of course you no know, it has this collective goal related to the strengthening of democracy um and again, the way in which libel deals with freedom of speech or the conflict between freedom of speech uh, and the protection of reputation uh, is that if the speech uh, is something that has a public interest uh, because it advances democracy or it advances certain goals related to democracy, the speech is going to be protected. Uh, that's, and that, that's, that's the defense of justification. Uh, if it doesn't advance any of these, uh, any of these goals, uh, uh, then uh, the person cannot be able to defend using justification uh, and he's going to be liable uh, because he breached reputation. doesn't matter if it's true or false uh, in the sense it, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter if, 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 uh, uh, if, if, if this is within the realm of disinformation or, or, or misinformation, it's about libel. You know? but, but, but again, it's the, it's the only way uh, it, 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 it connects in a system where there is no direct regulation of, of misinformation and disinformation. Yeah. Thank you so much. I think it our time is running a little bit yeah. short, so we should move on now. Um, should I uh, um, introduce Anvash or will you introduce yourself? Yeah. Okay. Um, it is our great pleasure <laughs> to um, introduce Andres Coltre, a lawyer, professor um, at the University of Public Service. And I'm sorry, I'm going to massacre this name. My Hungarian is terrible. Um, Pazmani Peter. Well, Close enough, Catholic University. He obtained his LLM uh, degree from University College London in 2007. Prior to that, he also studied at the International Institute of Human Rights in Strasbourg. He received his PhD from the Faculty of Law at the Pazmani University in 2008. From 2010 to 2019, he worked as a member of the Media Council. Um, and from 2018 to 21, uh, he held the position of rector of the National University of Public Service. His main research interests are in the areas of freedom of expression, media law, and personal rights. And so I'm going to try to set up your PowerPoint on my computer right. so that we can avoid the same technical glitch that we just um, worked through. So I'm going to share my screen from this computer. And... Um, to work. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it looks like one thing if you just give that a try. All right, I'll just check the original schedule and it says that I need to be I need to finish my on this part this this section needs to be finished by 2 30 so I have 30 minutes is that correct you can go over we were <laughs> running like 15 minutes All over right. and honestly this is your day this is your workshop right. so I just I'll, I'll be as, as short as, as it is uh, possible so thank you very much Bo for organizing this event and, and having me here. I, I'd like to give a 
an overview on uh, the European approach to this information, meaning uh, the approach of the member states of the European Union as and the European Union as a supranational body as, as well. And, uh, and I also want to raise some questions or issues re relating to the to the EU's and uh, member states approach to, to this problem. Obviously, untrue factual statements uh, as such cannot be regulated according to the European doctrine of uh, freedom of expression, but in certain cases and under certain circumstances, uh, uh, untrue statements can be prohibited, can be restricted. We already talked about defamation law, that's obviously everywhere uh, in Europe. In most of the countries, uh, we even get the criminal defamation, so criminal libel. Uh, denial of crimes against humanity, that's a very European thing, Holocaust denial and the denial of the, of the communist uh, um, crimes against humanity. False or misleading statements made during election campaigns, that also it's a universal thing, I guess, misleading commercial communication and scaremongering. We have a few countries which uh, which has this uh, provision in their in their criminal codes. So basically, these these are the the possible restrictions on on uh, disinformation. And as you all recognize it, there are many different types of disinformation which are just not covered uh, by these by these provisions. Um, we have media regulation in Europe, we, on the level of the member states and on the EU level as well. So hate speech is another possible tool to fight against misinformation and disinformation. Right of flip reply is present everywhere in Europe. UK is an exception, but UK is not a member state of the EU anymore. So all the member states of the European Union has a certain right of reply rules, which is a which is a special, you know, tool or equipment to find against this information uh, in the case of broadcasting mainly and also the traditional press. Also, in most of the states, we, we have these new impartiality rules, the news programs on, on broadcasting, meaning television and radio needs to be impartial. And just an example how this can be used against this, this information right after Russia attacked Ukraine. Early last year, the UK's media regulator opened uh, an investigation against RT, meaning Russia Today, that is an uh, international English-speaking uh, um, television channel controlled by the Russian government mainly. And uh, obviously, the Ofcom found that uh, the news programs of RT was not, were not impartial, so they breached the, the Communications Act of the United Kingdom and Ofcom revoked the licenses of, uh, of RT. So impartiality is another means of finding against this information, only applicable in the case of traditional broadcasting, uh, which obviously limits its, uh, its uh, scope. Platform regulation is a very important subject in, in everywhere and also in the European Union. Currently, we still have a EU directive uh, originating from 2000. It's called the e-commerce directive and it established the, the so-called notice and takedown system. So online platforms do not need to monitor users' content, but once they are notified about uh, a certain illegal or infringing content available in their service, they have to investigate that uh, case and if the uh, certain content is illegal or infringing the law, then uh, they need to take it down. Basically, that's the system, which will be kept in place uh, under the new platform regulation that will be applicable in, uh, in a few weeks. It's called the Digital Services Act. Uh, still not applicable, but uh, it doesn't really help uh, against uh, the disinformation problem and it keeps the notice and takedown system in place. 
it's very important that only those uh, content uh, contents need to be taken down which are illegal. So this information, which is not illegal, which is not uh, breaching any uh, codified uh, provision, uh, cannot be taken down under this uh, this system. The EU published many recommendations regarding disinformation and misinformation in the last uh, uh, few years. Um, I'm also dealing with those in my in my draft paper, and uh, the EU triggered the establishment of this code of practice on disinformation, which is formally a self-regulatory tool signed by all the major technological uh, companies, from Apple to Amazon to Meta, uh, and TikTok, everyone is there. Formally self-regulation, but uh, this is something that was enforced by, by the European Commission. And all these technological giants just realized that uh, if they want to avoid strict regulation, then it's better for them to sign up for this self-regulatory tool. Um, the first version of this code of practice was published in 2018, but we have an updated version um, uh, that was that was made uh, made uh, public last year, 2020. The strengthened code of practice on this information. It's a really a long document. It contains 44 different commitments and 128 different measures in these areas, uh, mainly dealing with political advertising. So they want to keep uh, political advertising transparent. They want to demonetize this information through political advertising, ensuring the integrity of, of the services. So these are commitments and measures um, that the, the technological companies sign up for. And obviously there's a, a system supporting these, uh, these uh, commitments, uh, super uh, supervisory system. So the first baseline reports after uh, the publication of this code were published uh, in February this year. And just uh, some interesting data uh, from these reports. Google deprived disseminators of this information of 13 million euro in advertising revenue. That's what Google says, so we don't really know <laughs> what actually happened. Hopefully it's, it's, uh, it's true. TikTok removed 800,000 fake user accounts and Facebook uh, posted like 28 million fact checking tags attached to, to different posts and obviously that are uh, Many other uh, uh, measures these uh, these companies applied, and all of the others are also published their reports. The Digital Services Act won't really change the game in terms of uh, um, the uh, struggle against uh, disinformation or misinformation. Uh, it mainly seeks to protect users' freedom of expression, which is the other side of the story, and also a very important. Uh, very important uh, part of this uh, problem. Uh, the DSA, which will be applicable in a few weeks, uh, as I mentioned, requires users to be informed of the content the online platforms removed um, and uh, give them a proper reasons for this, uh, for this measure. Uh, and also, uh, give them the possibility to have a recourse to a dispute resolution mechanism, which is independent from the, from the online platform. Um, and if the dispute resolution mechanism uh, ends with an outcome that is not acceptable for the individual users, that they can uh, turn to a competent uh, state authority or, or court. Um, so there are certain procedural guarantees which provides um, a bigger or a, a stronger protection for, for users' freedom of speech. And also, uh, there's a very important principle there in Article 14, Paragraph 4, which says that the restrictions in the contractual courses between the user and, and a certain online platform must take into account freedom of expression 
of the user, obviously, and uh, media pluralism, if the user is a media company or a, or a media outlet, this is very uh, important. <clears throat> yeah, uh, so the EU's approach can help to achieve several objectives, uh, but some problems are clearly there. Um, my concern is that none of the EU's documents deal with the issue whether disinformation or misinformation is protected by freedom of expression or not. So there's not a clear line between protected speech and unprotected speech. They, they just don't mention this problem at all. And, and I think this is something that uh, that needs to be done, need to make clear uh, whether something is protected by uh, free speech or, or not. Also, uh, I found a certain hidden elitism in the, in the approach of the EU. They, previously, they, all, they always turned turn to the traditional media, legacy media, the editors of legacy media. They know what people, what, what are the interests of, of the people. Uh, now that people don't really trust traditional media anymore, and it's not an American thing, it's, it's also something that's happening uh, everywhere in Europe. Uh, now they turn to the fact checking community members or the fact checking community. I think the fact checking community, I don't really know who they are actually. So <laughs> I, know, I know a few people who, who work for, for a fact checking group, but uh, I think. Uh, the problem with the fact-checking community are similar than the problem of legacy or traditional media. So uh, how can we ensure the independence of such a body? Uh, how can people trust uh, in, in such a body or, or certain individuals? So it's you know, something that needs to be done uh, above uh, above the the people, I mean the decision on on this information according to EU documents. Uh, then I, I briefly mentioned this lack of honesty on the side of uh, the European Commission, uh, the code of practice of of this information, uh, formally a self regulatory instrument, but practically, in reality, it is more like a co regulatory tool imposed by the European Commission. A very interesting episode happened last year in terms of disinformation. It's something that uh, hasn't been happening. I mean, hasn't happened since the, the fall of the Iron Curtain back in 89, 1990. Uh, media outlets were banned in the EU or in, in the European Union uh, and as a, as a measure of, uh, of prior restraint, or we can say censorship. These, uh, these media outlets are Russian broadcasters, Russian television channels. 1st of March last year, the European Council published the decision and the regulation. Regulation is a, a tool which is the piece of legislation that is directly applicable in all EU member states. So there's no need to implement them on the state level. And they actually, uh, banned uh, two Russian channels, uh, enabling, facilitating, otherwise contrib contributing to broadcast. These, these activities are all banned. And later on, the list uh, was updated, and now uh, there are several outlets on that uh, list. Uh, as I told you, the scope of this measure is unprecedented in a, in a system which uh, protects uh, media freedom and, and freedom of speech uh, generally. Um, and also this uh, in unprecedented, in unprecedented in the way that it not only covers broadcasting media, but it also covers the social media accounts of these uh, broadcasting companies, the search engines, uh, hit lists. Uh, so Google is banned from uh, showing the the links to 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 RTs and and the others uh, websites, and the ban is a departure from the e-commerce directives ban on general monitoring. I saw you that uh, these uh, online platforms don't need to monitor users' content. This is an exception. Uh, 
obviously the reasons behind the decision is are really clear so we, we can really understand that uh, from a legal perspective uh, it, this decision may uh, um, raises some some serious issues problem of censorship and and prior restraint uh, according to the European Court of Human Rights case law, prior restraint in itself is not uh, something that cannot happen in a in a party state to the European Convention. Uh, but the regulation does not respond to the question of how this can be done, uh, um, taking account the specific circumstances and the content to be prohibited is taken for granted by the EU that a prior Restraint, the general restriction is permissible in the in the present case. This would be only so if uh, if uh, the measure is compatible with the European approach to media freedom. Uh, if the other general grounds for the restriction, necessity test, the legality test, the proportionality test, uh, uh, are are well founded. Um, the EU argued uh, that RT and Sputnik and later on some other uh, broadcasters constitute a significant and direct threat to the public order uh, and security of the union may justify government interference in this regard. Uh, there are some commentators uh, I highlighted the quotation from Dirk Warhol, is probably the most well-known uh, experts on, on ECTHR case law, you, you know, Dirk, man. Um, he's not very happy with that, no. with that regulation. He uh, his blogs up on our <laughs> website, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, just to give you an example, in Hungary, uh, it was only one media distribution company which, uh, which transmitted the, the channel RT. And it was it was established. I mean, the Hungarian company was was established in a small town outside of Budapest. So theoretically, a few hundred people uh, would have had access to to RT in, in Hungary. So this is not something that is a strong influence that, that constitutes a serious and immediate threat to to public order or or public security. Uh, the recitals of the decision and regulation indicate two reasons for the ban, disinformation and propaganda. I just mentioned that disinformation is in many cases protected speech. So it's not something that is a really a good, uh, good uh, uh, reason for, for such a wide ban. And propaganda in many cases is also protected speech with the exception of propaganda for war, which is completely different and can be lawfully banned under the ICCPR regime. Uh, the propaganda is, you know, it's not a word we particularly like, it's coming from a Russian language, but, uh, but it's not something that is, that is illegal. Um, last summer, the European Court of Justice dismissed the uh, RT's application, so, uh, According to the court decision, um, these concerns were not serious enough. Dick also published a blog post after the, the decision by the uh, ECJ. So he's not very happy with the reasoning of the decision. Prior restraint as a problem was not mentioned at all. Proportionality was not really mentioned. The necessary standards either under ICCPR or under uh, ECTHR case law are really nowhere. Um, so it's really conclusion can be that uh, a political decision was really justified by, by legal means, which is not always you know, uh, the best uh, move forward. So some future considerations, some considerations for, for future debates uh, in the European Union, I think it would be useful to really draw a line between allowed, I mean, protected freedom of speech and speech that can be regulated. Uh, some of you already mentioned Kaz Zanstein. Uh, he just published a book two or three years ago on, on the disinformation problem. And even, even in the context of the American 
First Amendment law, he argues that intentional lies may be constitutionally prohibited. And I don't know if you agree with that here in the US, but it's definitely, it is the case in, in Europe. So one possible thing to do is just to, to widen the scope of the provisions of uh, that restrict uh, freedom of expression in the future. Let's say in the context of an election, for example, misleading, untrue factual statements may be prohibited. Why? 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 Uh, what's the what's the uh, reason to to protect them? But if someone is protected free speech, then the question arises: Is it is it okay just to ask some private companies, social media platforms? Uh, first of all, just to regulate speech that is otherwise allowed and protected by the constitutional standards of a certain country. And I think this is a very, very difficult uh, question. Uh, also, it would be useful to differentiate between disinformation coming from the government and uh, from average people. Uh, average people can have different intentions. Um, they don't necessarily know that, uh, that something that uh, they publish is not true. Uh, this is the misinformation and disinformation divide, obviously. But uh, as far as uh, the EU's approach go, uh, this differentiation is just not is non-existent at the moment. There's a possi uh, possibility to regulate online platforms much more strictly than than currently is the case and will be the case after DSA becomes uh, applicable, setting out certain obligations vis-a-vis uh, um, uh, -vis content not protected by freedom of expression, um, unprotected disinformation. And also, some of you talked about the, the filter bubble problem we all familiar with. Uh, the DSA does not deal with this issue at all apart from some principles which, which uh, are not uh, directly applicable by the, by the platforms. Uh, obviously, this is a problem because this would fundamentally affect the business model of the platform. So this is not something that can be easily done by them. But the regulation of the traditional media sets a good example in this regard. So we can imagine provisions uh, which, uh, which just uh, provides the uh, users of social media platforms uh, with uh, information on, on public issues, public interest stories, easy access to divergent dissenting views. Social media is very much capable to do that technically, but they are not doing this at the moment. This is something that is similar to the impartial news coverage provision in the terms of broadcasting. Uh, it's not, not, not a good analogy in, in, in every sense, but uh, it can really inform uh, the future regulation of social media platforms. And also right of reply can be easily applied to the social media platforms as well, at least technically. Um, my Final con conclusion is that the outsourcing of decisions about disinformation by putting them in the hands of private companies uh, needs to be avoided if possible. Because uh, here in Europe, uh, we don't really distinguish between power coming from the state or from private entities. We just want to regulate or restrict all types of powers. And nowadays, it seems that in the public sphere, private companies can exercise much greater powers than state authorities or, or governments. So the member states uh, and the EU must continue to play a leading role in shaping the rules, uh, in the, the rules. And I hope the European Commission or uh, the government of certain member states can agree with that conclusion. I'm not really sure that they agree with that, but I hope that's the case. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. And I will stop the screen share now. Oh, I guess you have to.
take Thank care you. of that. Do we have some questions for us? Charlotte? Uh, yeah, so I thought this was really interesting. Um, I wanted to ask about, um, I guess, enforcement and remedies, um, inspired by Eduardo's question from this morning. Um, and I guess, in particular, whether you think like remedies under the DSA are, uh, you know, speak to the harm. Um, so do whatever remedies are contemplated sort of undo the harm of the misinformation or is it more of like a sort of deterrent, you know, you won't want to do this again in the future, but the harm still persists right now? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, DSA, the, 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 the most important aim of that, that uh, piece of legislation is to protect users free speech. Even if a certain user uh, posts something that is disinformation or misinformation, so pre nowadays uh, anyone can be blocked, suspended, or uh, anyone's content can be deleted from Facebook or Twitter or, or anywhere else. After the DSA becomes applicable, they need to give proper reasoning for that. Uh, you can go to an out-of-court dispute settlement body, you can take your case to the court. So there are certain mainly procedural guarantees with, which protect uh, individual users. Uh, on the other side uh, of, of the issue, uh, if a user content is illegal, defama defamatory contains hate speech, misleading advertisement whatsoever, uh, then the platforms have the duty to take that down. So it's it's much stricter than the section 230 here. Uh, but apart from this, the, the DSA doesn't say anything about this information. So if this information is not something that is illegal, then it's protected speech and it can be deleted by the platform, but with the right reasons and uh, a certain procedural guarantees. When these procedural guarantees are recognized by the platforms, in the end, the final outcome can be more or less the same as it is now. So if they want to delete something because it breaches their own terms of services, for example, like you know, these codes put up by Google or, or, or Meta or, or any other company, uh, if, so, if a certain piece is not illegal, but it breaches that, that this private speech code, and in the end, uh, it can be deleted, but it, in a, a little bit more difficult way than, than currently is the case. I think that's the, the only uh, way the, the DSA affects the disinformation issue. Um, thank you. Thanks, Andres. Two questions. Um, the one is sort of combines um, what you said at the beginning of your presentation and also what you mentioned at the end. And it's very interesting. Thank you. Um, and that's in relation to the, uh, the right of reply. Mm -hmm. And um, I realize that uh, it, it's quite interesting because I know that in the hate speech realm, it's quite a lot of um, work being done about um, hate speech generated by bots. Um, and the same would obviously apply to disinformation generated by bots. And the regulation, as I understand it, in relation to hate speech would happen in regard to those who, who speak back to, to the bot speech and whose speech in response to that of the bot suddenly becomes, um, becomes hate speech for example, um, and that their speech might be regulated, as I understand it, in terms of the EU system taken down, whereas the bot speech might actually remain mm -hmm. online, because is the bot actually somebody who can be regulated, who's in control of the bot, for example? Mm -hmm. um, so I was wondering how that right to reply would work in relation to, to a bot, mm -hmm. okay, which generates false information. Um, and I'm also interested in the hate speech thing, but let's stick to the false information. And um, in a way that also made me think uh, sort of this one about um, the idea that will open debate and the right to actually debate that which is false will ultimately lead to a better understanding of what might be true. Mm -hmm. 
false, which takes us back to what John was saying earlier on to say that, well, let's take the truth out of it. But can we, if what we're doing is we're regulating the intentional lies, because who's going to determine the lies? So this comes into number two. How do we determine what is or isn't a lie? And if we're going to be using so-called independent fact checkers to check that out, um, who controls the fact checkers? Because if, they, if the fact checkers are controlled by governments, for example, or by powerful platforms, then what, what incentive is there actually to find the truth? So these are the sort of things that I'm, mm -hmm. I'm grappling about. So what about chat GPT, right? You're yeah, into geez, that yeah. When you've got an algorithm that you put in stuff and it propagates stuff widely. Yeah. yeah. How is you going to deal with chat GPT and a writer? Report? How are academics How going to deal with chat GPT? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. All right. Yeah. Really good questions. Uh, I think the right of reply is, is not something that can be there, I mean, applicable without any serious modifications to, to social media platforms. Because uh, right of reply is mainly a tool against defamation. If something is said that is not true, then that certain person, which is named in that publication, can start a court procedure. procedure. Uh, obviously, if right of reply is something that is a duty of the platforms, who's, who's not the speaker, then right of reply in this context would mean something like that, that they have to, if, you know, uh, if the attacked party asks the platform to give his or her side of the story, then the platform needs to put on a link to another opinion or something like that. So it's not something that is the duty of the original poster or the holder of the social media account, but if it's the duty of the social media itself, then obviously even uh, something that is posted by a chatbot or chat GPT or whatever uh, can, be, uh, can be dealt with. Uh, uh, in this in this uh, in this regard um because i I'm, i read i always read these uh, papers in in journals in hungary and they really make me mad that they are arguing whether robots and and uh, any anyone uh, which works with the uh, with artificial intelligence are persons from the legal sense of the world uh, word and uh, and I always think, how on earth can a robot be, you know, someone who who, who can have own, his own pro property or can be liable for defamation or whatever? Is I don't want to live in a world <laughs> where robots are in the legally recognized individuals. But I'm not sure whether this this won't happen in the in the foreseeable future, uh, and that solves the problem as well because then bots or robots or whatever yes, can yeah. could, could could be sued but uh, as right of reply as i imagine in this context is the duty of the social media platform and not the speaker so uh um it's not it's it, it wouldn't be more than just uh just publishing certain links to other the other side of the story um intentional lies and how to determine what is a lie to to one of the great issues of freedom of uh, expression and its doctrine. Yeah, that's the, as I understand, that's the foundation, that's the cornerstone of uh, of the First Amendment jurisprudence that uh, the government or any state body is certainly not in the position to make a decision whether something is true or, or untrue. Uh, but, you know, I'm, I was talking about the, the European approach and defamation law is something that is very much existing in, in Europe. And in all defamation cases, someone needs to make a decision whether the publication was true or not. Um, and uh, in the case of Holocaust denial, it's easier because it's, it's an official truth that Holocaust happened, but it's also, okay, what's the specific detail the certain person denies. So it's not always a very broad denial. Sometimes they deny certain details, certain facts, and you need to be a historian to make a, you know, a 
argument against that uh, that uh, denial. So, but in a court procedure, for example, in the case of the French uh, Holocaust denier, or we had uh, David Irving, the the English Holocaust, uh, then we have a guy from Canada with the German surname, uh, Ernst uh, Zündel or Zündel. Zündel. Yeah. Um, someone made a decision whether what the guy said is true or, or not true. So it's not something that is uh, that is unusual or never happens in, in legal systems. And I, I would never advocate for a broad ban on disinformation, saying that everything that is not true needs to be banned. That's absolutely unworkable. In certain contexts like election, or, or uh, in the case of you know public or uh, national security or or uh, breaches of the public order or whatever, I can imagine that uh, uh, broader restrictions of uh, of freedom of expression can theoretically be introduced into European legal system on the national level. So it's definitely not something that can be done by the European Union as a supranational body. It's, all, it's up to the member states to make individual decisions what they allow and what they, what they don't allow. Uh, so overbreath, talk to me about overbreath. Does it not exist as a doctrine in the EU? It seems to me that uh, banning all RT content uh, is grossly overbroad. Uh, gardening with uh, Russia television or RT's restaurant recommendations in La Habana isn't a complete uh, denial of speech and press rights disproportionate in proportionality doctrine terms when if it doesn't relate to Ukraine or the war in Ukraine, you're banning speech that's not false and unrelated to any of the predicates that you cited in your presentation. Uh, also, where's the Strasbourg court here? Article 10, freedom of press, I thought you had to have something that was prescribed by law and necessary in a free and democratic society. Does necessary in a free and democratic society not imply that you can't over-regulate or abridge a right where it doesn't directly advance the government's legitimate or, or pressing and substantial interest? Uh, and and uh, finally, is there uh, uh, any uh, pushback or, or general concern about the EU asserting the power to ban a media outlet? I have to say it strikes me as astonishing, not creating liability for false speech related to Ukraine or the Ukraine war, but again, gardening with RT, uh, Formula One race predictions with RT. This has nothing to do uh, with the war in Ukraine or propaganda for war, yet all of that speech is equally banned. Can I even go to RT.com or .RT? I mean, is it cut off completely in Europe or? Um... I think the the ISP is also cut off the the artist domain, so probably it's accessible here. You need to check everything's that. accessible here, <laughs> <laughs> for better or worse. I couldn't access when I when I made my research on this. I couldn't access artist website in Hungary, so that's for sure. And the funny thing is that it's not even in the regulation. It they leaked out a certain letter written by someone in the European Council. The name was deleted, so we don't know who, who wrote it. And the letter uh, went to certain online companies like Google and Meta and all the others. And the letter said that, oh, the regulation needs to be interpreted in the way to cover all social media accounts as well, search lists as well, and everything online. Whereas the regulation in its text only talks about broadcasting. Yeah. Um, we don't call it the overbreath doctrine. We call it the necessity and proportionality test, but it's something that is pretty similar. So all, the, all this rights limitation needs to be necessary in a democratic society and proportionate or the legitimate aim pursued by the restrictions. Uh, I don't think that's that's the case here. And I think the European Council made a very political decision. In a, in a, in a situation which is unprecedented, the EU never faced a war before in 
in, in, in Europe. So you, you can you can find some proper reasons for that decision, but if you if you look at it at uh, from a legal perspective, then uh, there are serious problems with this. And what I find astonishing is that the European Court of Justice, which is obviously the whole courts are made of lawyers, basically, they don't really deal with these issues in their in their decisions. So the European Court of Justice acts like uh, a political body in this case, which is really, really un un unlucky. Um, the Strasbourg court, I don't know, probably they can take this case to Strasbourg as well. It will take a few more years. I don't know if that's happening or not. So it's not something that is a very quick solution. I would be really surprised if the Strasbourg court uh, would declare this uh, application inadmissible or or after a decision of admissibility, they would argue that it's not the breach of Article 10. I would be very much surprised, but who knows? Um, and my concern is the war is an unprecedented situation. That okay, that's that's arguable in Europe, at least. But uh, these. Decisions by the European Council and the European Court of Justice can set a really dangerous precedent. Imagine a new pandemic, for example, a new COVID in the forthcoming years, or the, uh, a situation where there is the, the public order is in, in danger. Then, who will stop European bodies to, you know, just to restrict free speech or, or media freedom if they already did this once and no one argued against it, no European government argued against it, no, no important intellectual figure in Europe argued against this ban. So it is something that is very much accepted by, by uh, the decision makers in, in, in Europe. And I find it really problematic. Thank you so much. Do you think we're, we should move on to the, the final panel? I know, um, it's getting late, um, so I don't want to take a break. I so, agree. Okay. Let's roll. So who's next? Edward is going to go next. Edward is going to go next. Okay. Um, then I, what I'd like to do, Eduardo, is pull up your presentation on my computer, just like I did. Um, okay. So that way, I think it'll be a little bit smoother. Should I give you a little introduction here? Yeah. Okay. Eduardo Bartoni. Um, Professor at uh, in Buenos Aires. He is currently the representative of the Regional Office for South America of the Inter American Institute of Human Rights. He was the first director of the Access to Public Information Agency, which is the Argentine Data Protection and Access to Information Authority. He was the founder and the first director of the Center for Studies on Freedom of Expression and Access to Information at Palermo University School of Law, Argentina. He's also the executive director of the Due Process of Law Foundation till May of 2006. So we the bio goes on with many accomplishments, but I think that will get us started. Um, so, Eduardo, if you just give me a moment, I'll just pull up your presentation and hand you my computer. So let me just um, move the camera to you. There we go. Okay, perfect. You're... Thank you very much. Are you not able to get to it because of the, the pop-up menus? No, I wanted to put it on the screen. Slide. Here from start. 
Yeah. Hopefully that will do it. Perfect. There we go. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Well, thank you very much. Thanks again for, for having me in this very exciting project, Ron. And thanks for the Columbia University the Global Freedom of Expression program also to host us here. I think that's very useful to have this conversation. It's just not sometimes it is not very, very common that before, you know, doing a collaborative collaborative work, the people, you know, join together, particularly if we are from different parts of the world. If we are all in the same country, it's much easier. So thank you very much, Ron, for for your ideas and putting this this together. So um, as I mentioned uh, this morning, I, my plan with the, with this uh, paper is to change a little bit, to change a little bit in the approach that uh, we are having now. We as a community of experts, a community of policymakers, that we are having to uh, cope with the problem of misinformation and disinformation. This is the the, the my real my 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 real goal. And frankly, uh, I uh, for the final paper, I will elaborate uh, on an originally uh, paper that was developed uh, with the Center for Studies of Freedom of Expression at Palermo University in Argentina, and it was posted in the website of CELE, that center, uh, two years ago. But this is an ongoing work, and I hope to receive feedback in this conversation or after this conversation, because as I said, I want to to uh, to to complement what I did uh, some time ago. So uh, I I I would say, or I I want to to first repeat that uh, we're trying to answer where where are we. I think that the the state uh, uh, responses to the recent crisis is um, that are caused by misinformation. Uh, the, the responses are aimed to establish liability or regulation for those who facilitate the dissemination of, for, of misinformation or disinformation. Um, and in fact, it is not only something that states uh, are doing, but also the private sector, internet companies, especially large platforms, uh, have developed many, many techniques, measures, and instruments to address the phenomenon. In some, at, at, in some moment, I started talking, this is not part of this uh, work, but I, I started talking about the problem of private censorship because of the uh, tools that the private companies are implementing. Um, so my point is that we have been working, again, we as a community of expert academics, civil society, policymakers, uh, we, in my perspective, we did a little uh, to identify the origin of misinformation, to evaluate the phenomenon, in, particularly in light of specific obligation for se certain sectors. Uh, I guess that Andras, when you did your presentation, you mentioned that we need to make some sort of distinction between what uh, when the problem is coming from misinformation initiated by the public official or as a public figure in comparison with another uh, citizens. Uh, and this is exactly what I, one one part uh, of, of one of my the main part of, of 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 my research. It's not the same, but we did, as I said, I think that we we did not pay attention to the obligations that these particular sectors of the society, politics, public figures already have. And when the, I mention obligations. I am mentioning, as I will see, I will show legal obligation and ethical obligations as well that are established by some uh, regulations. So in some way uh, that um, the, my some assumptions for this paper is that I think that it is wrong or it would be wrong 
to attribute uh, to social media an exclusive, and I want to underscore, underscore an exclusive role in the new disinformation crisis and the impact uh, impacts in the information uh, ecosystem. Uh, as Andr Andras said, this information, in my view, and I think that I share Andras' uh, comments, uh, has different impacts depending on who promotes it, uh, public versus private people. And finally, uh, in the paper, I elaborate or I, 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 I build on the ideas that public officials have specific, specific and special responsibilities regarding their speech. Uh, one of the main problems of my, my paper, or it's not a problem, my challenge is to show that I am still a uh, defender of freedom of expression, and I'm still defending the freedom of, uh, of expression of public officials and, and public figures as well. And I will say something about that. So uh, what I did or what we did in the, for, the, for this paper uh, we look into some of the obligation of public officials and other public persons to tell the truth. I, I, I am saying in the paper that there are, as I said, legal and ethical obligations uh, that public officials have, uh, and they have to take some specific measures to avoid errors in the information they disseminate in the exercise of their office on, on their duties. And for that, information provided by, by officials when public speaking has ethical and legal obligations. So I'm going again and again to the origin of the disinformation and, the, and misinformation and not to the problem of dissemination. Uh, of course, I, I, and I, I, this is one part of the, of, of the draft that I distributed. Of course, I do not uh, consider a minor problem or a not problem at all uh, the dissemination issue. I think that there is a problem there that the, the, the internet and the media platforms has a lot to do there. But as I said at the very beginning, no, they don't have an exclusive role on that. And I want to change a little bit the, the, the approach. What I cover and what I will cover in the paper. Well, first I will start with what I call the taxonomy on false expressions to justify the rejection. I will talk about, uh, about what Cass Sunstein and others uh, talk about the moral taboo that a false expression is always bad. But we will see that not always is bad a false expression, that sometimes we accept in social Lysing false expression. And I put some examples there uh, that say that it is possible that in some situations, false express expressions not always have negative consequences. A false expression can have a good consequence. Um, then I will cover what the Inter American uh, System of Human Rights uh, have been dealing with false expression from governmental officials, particularly in two cases against Venezuela and more cases that the, 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 the Inter-American court decided touched the, the problem of false expression and asked the question about if they are covered or not covered under the Inter-American Convention on Human Rights. Uh, then the paper will cover the other, another, another aspect which is not just the inter-American system on human rights, but I'm going to specific, you know, uh, domestic legislation, particularly criminal law, administrative law, and the code of ethics in public administration. And I try to, 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 to detect there why we consider as a community that false expressions coming from public officials are bad and in some situations are criminalized. And in some situations, they can cause some nullification of some acts uh, delivered by the public official. The paper also includes some, something that we discussed uh, this morning with Joanna, 
some of the regulations that we have in Latin America in the realm of electoral laws. And I try to expose there, to show there that we already have uh, things to, um, or legislation that either deserve to be enforced or to change, but we are not putting any effort in those aspects of the regulation, in this case, electoral. And finally, uh, I, I, I include uh, also another aspect that come up after the pandemic and all the false statement that came uh, during the pandemic. So I include regulations for the health sector which is also something that is very common. It is not possible. I mean, there are specific regulations for a health sector. For example, if you're a pharmaceutical, you need to be very careful when you are going to publicize uh, your drugs or whatever. There are regulations. You cannot say whatever you want. And if you are saying whatever you want and it's false, you can be, you know, uh, held responsible and ever get sanctions or another uh, consequences. So those are the 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 main the main see what those are the main aspects that I cover in the paper or within the paper. I I I wanted to stop a little bit about this chart uh, about what I call the taxonomy of false statements. This taxonomy is coming, it's not uh, my own creation. It's coming from uh, the um, Cass Sunstein in the books Liars. Uh, but I think that it's very interesting to go back to this idea that uh, I, I, I mentioned, which is trying to respond if all false statements, all false expressions deserve some sort of, you know, by, of consequence. Uh, social consequence or legal consequence. So there are different factors that CAS include and different consequences. The factors are the state of mind, the magnitude of the harm, the likelihood of the harm, and the timing of the harm, okay? If we see the column A, any exception, any expression that fall in the column A for sure will deserve uh, will deserve uh, um, a consequence, and and we will uh, and I show in the paper that all the expressions that fall in the column A deserve consequences on 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 on, um, on coming from uh, legal regulation from the law or from ethical uh, regulations as well. For example, just the, for the sake of an example, if the person lie, the magnitude is, is great the likelihood to the harm of the harm is certain and is in me imminent, of course, this kind of, 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 of expression deserve a consequence. And this is the typical case of incitement to genocide, for example, coming from some, some specific people. But if you think in some kind of combination of all these, these factors and the consequences, you, we can find situations in which we are going to be at least not very sure if we are open to establish some consequences. And this is key for the thing that, for, for the problem that we are dealing because this information or misinformation, and I don't define in them now, but this information of misinformation is huge in the, in the, in the social network. So we are planning to, or there are plans to regulate or to moderate content or to regulate everything. But there could be some false statements that, uh, that fall in some aspects. For example, the state of mind is reasonable. The person really believe that, 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 that what he or she is saying is true. The magnitude of the harm is non-existent. It's highly improbable that something happened. And if it happens after, something if the distant future i'm just telling you the, the 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 column d we will probably agree that it is not necessary to establish 
any consequence not to uh, um, delete the information and so on and so forth. So the problem is, 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 is very complex. Why I did that? Because I want to show that there are all, almost all of the expressions that fall in column A or with some combination with column B in our legal system already have some consequences. And again, my point there is why don't we enforce those consequences or why don't we work to improve those kind of legislation? This is the, the, the main goal of the, of, the, of the paper. So uh, as I mentioned, when I explained the charter, I asked, to you or ask myself in which cases it's possible to legally regulate falsehood. Lying in general terms is morally reprehensibly. This is the moral taboo that, that is, is uh, pe people. And so if you ask someone in the street, is good or bad to lie? People are going to say it's bad. But then if we start giving some kind of examples, at some point, that person is going to start doubting or not being very sure if it is if it's bad. And I put some funny examples in 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 in, in a paper. Um, the justification for 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 their for 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 the consequences and the type of sanctions should I say may there, but I think that it should vary according to the subject or its authors. So again, who is speaking and the subject is always, it's always important to detect, you know, if we are going to impose some consequence. And false expressions are not legally reprehensible in every case, and I say, and therefore, for example, prohibited or silence. Um, as I mentioned, when I, I read uh, what the, uh, some sort of the index of the paper, um, there are three parts that are important for me that are important to be covered in the paper. One is the inter-American human rights system, then the general regulation, criminal law, administrative law, and code of ethics, and then the specific regulations. Um, I have here, and I can read here for each of these regulations, uh, some aspects, but uh, for the sake of the time for uh, this workshop, I prefer to skip it. It is in the paper, there are in the papers. I can say, for example, that the Inter-American Human Rights System is very, very strong in its decisions saying that you cannot um, impose a, a consequence of an expression just saying that it is not true that there are some expressions that even are not true, they are protected by freedom of expression by Article 13. There is a huge, I mean, a lot of your experience coming from the advisory opinion number five in 1985. So that creates a, a, a little bit problem when we, when we think about um, um, imposing, um, imposing uh, sanctions to public officials, but, the inter-American system also said in some of the decisions that this is correct unless the people know that they are doing some sort of false statement. There are a couple of cases against Venezuela, Rios versus Venezuela, and Peroso versus Venezuela, in where in which in where the court was very, very clear that in saying that public officials have freedom of expression, but they have to uh, work more carefully before they do some sort of expressions because of the consequences of their expressions. In other words, they are saying, you can say whatever you want, but the consequences of what you are saying are not mm -hmm. the same consequences of, uh, of what some ordinary citizen is doing. Uh, in, in terms of uh, state regulations, as I say, or domestic regulations, is, is, is better domestic regulations. It's very interesting to see what happened with criminal law in Latin American countries. In all criminal, in all Latin American, uh, Latin American criminal laws, or most of the countries, we have the crime of 
in Spanish is uh, falsedad ideológica, it's false ideology. What that, that the, the crime is, if you are a public official and you put something that is false in a document that can create some harm, this is a crime. So falsity there, saying something false in a document is coming to the real of the moral taboo. False expressions saying something that is false deserve a very high consequence, which is criminal law. Of course, saying is not the same of writing. I agree with that. We don't have a crime which says, if you say something false, you committed a crime. What I wanted to, to, to demonstrate here is that for our community, if a public official say something false and write it in a document, this is a crime. So we consider something there that false statement coming from a public official is problematic because they, you know, a, a lot of arguments that are there. Trust is one of the arguments, uh, uh, trust of the community and so on and so forth. Administrative law is something similar. If you are a public official and you knowingly include something that is wrong in a document, that document can be nullified. So the consequence is high. And in codes of ethics of, of, of public administration, you have a bunch of, 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 of well, you have some or many, you have many uh, examples in which you can see that um, if you are a public official, you have a duty to tell the truth. All the code of ethics of public administration say something like that. So you have, and what happened if you fail in the code of ethics? Well, you can be sanctioned. So again, saying something that is false have consequences if you are a public official. We are not paying that much attention to that part of the legislation, and we are working much more now in regulating uh, media platforms and so on, which I could agree, but I'm saying we need to look at other, other. And, and finally, and, and we say something this morning, I'm not going to repeat, is very similar with electoral campaigns and the case of health, health uh, care regulations. Uh, it's very, I mean, we have regulation, we have law legislation that if you say something that it is not true, you are going to have consequences in electoral, uh, legislation, it is very clear. I mean, they can suspend you uh, as a political party. They can uh, suspend the, um, how do you say, the, um, the it's not donation, you, the, um, the support coming from, uh, economic support coming from government and so on and so forth. So some conclusions. There is a, that I will include or that I include in the paper. There is a mandate and an exception, an expectation, sorry, Sometimes explicit in some cases and tacit in others that official must express true facts and that therefore manifesting themselves, they must apply verification criteria with more rigor than any other person. It was also shown that failure to do so in certain circumstances can have re relevant consequences ranging from criminal to ethical. So public officials have a duty to tell the truth regarding their free speech uh, and their speech and expression, sorry. And following this logic of this obligation, we could look into new possible lines of investigation in the search for solutions to, this, to the dissemination of this information and the harm to public debate, which is exactly how we began this, 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 this workshop this morning with Ron's statement that the, one of the main aims is to look for solutions to, to the problems, and I would like to contribute in this one. So thank you very much, and I am open for comments, questions, or whatever. Thanks. Thank you, Eduardo. Would anybody like to jump in with a question? Oh. Okay. So it, what do you do about a Donald Trump or a Jair Bolsonaro? I think they would probably fundraise over accusations, credible accusations of false speech. And I'm not even getting to Nicolas Maduro or Hugo Chavez. By the way, Hugo Chavez rigged the 2020 election from the grave, according to some of the QAnon people, but I digress. I mean, there's a serious problem, isn't there, 
with uh, the fox guarding the hen house. And if you take a Maduro or a Chavez in Venezuela, courts and government agencies are unlikely to follow the law. So going to the fourth point on your last slide, I really am curious. I don't disagree with any of your normative points about the morality or legality of truth telling, but if you have uh, someone who has, a, or you know, bring it home to the U.S., uh, Ron DeSantis in Florida can tell all the lies he wants, and neither the legislature nor agencies nor the the state courts are going to do a damn thing about it. So if there's going to be some means of calling this out and enforcing accountability. I think it's going to have to be outside, at least in some places, the formal structure of government. So what are your, maybe I'm wrong about that, if you think yeah, I'm wrong, so, so, but, yeah. but what are your enforcement mechanisms? It seems to me they're going to have to be extra governmental. Now, this is a really good question, and, and we exchanged this conversation at the very beginning when, when we started talking about my paper some months ago. Uh, and you make me think about that. And you, you're you right. The, 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 the main problem from coming from 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 my paper or from my idea is that it could be seen as a very and I don't want to be misunderstood here a very academic paper that it doesn't have any impact in the real world because what I'm saying it is not going to be enforced and now my question is why and I'm trying to go to to your question and is your question so do you think that this is going to to be enforced this. So one of the baseline of my paper is that I am believing in independent judiciary, independent judges, and not in judges that are co-opted by the government and to an, on an any specific time. If I, 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 and this is problematic around the world, but is you mentioned examples, Hugo Chavez, I mean, there is no independent judiciary in, 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 in Venezuela. There is no independent judiciary today in, in Nicaragua or in other, in, in other countries. So what I am proposing is something that is not going to work because, but not because the idea is a bad idea. This is what I think, mm -hmm. but it's because another problem that I am not trying to solve here, which is how we are going to support the, uh, the, the, the independency of the, the the judiciary, the rule of law, and the division of, 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 of the different powers, and so on and so forth. So, but this is another problem because I really believe if we have an independent judge that can see what uh, uh, um, two things, if we have in the, we we I mean. To, for for this to to work, we need an independent judiciary, an independent you know body that can go against powerful public officials or public figures. First thing, second thing, maybe maybe the rules that I quote here, I include here, the legislation, is not perfect, and maybe we need to start thinking in some reform to that to that legislation as well. My point in the paper is that our effort is more on regulating the, the social platforms than in thinking to regulate again or to change the regulation in this in in this area so i that's why i finished saying a new line to work maybe we need maybe what i said about criminal law administrative law or code of ethics is not enough and i'm going to 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 your point because it's not enough the judges are not going to be open to apply that. Well, why don't we think in also changing that, that part of the regulation at the same time that we are thinking in changing the regulation of social media platforms? I don't know if I'm answering you. Answering you. And, and I think, you know, Joanna was talking about African systems, which have some, some independence, but not perfect independence, and judges with some courage, but not perfect courage. Mm -hmm. And so my suggestion is just Think about solutions that involve new regulations and judges, but perhaps think about solutions that might take the government out of the, the truth-telling loop mm -hmm. or the, the falsehood calling out loop. Because you know, even in a system that's imperfectly democratic, it seems to me that having voters, uh, having politicians or government officials who lie called out for it 
by some entity with uh, credibility with at least some voters might not be a perfect solution, but it seems to me it's better than nothing. But I'm sure other people have other ideas. But that's all I'm suggesting. Well, yeah, so, uh, that, that was really interesting. Thank you, um, Edward. So perhaps an argument to help you counter the dilemma that you expressed at the beginning of your presentation, which was, if I'm going to be regulating falsehoods from government officials, am I really a defender of freedom of expression? I suppose a way in which you could try and address that is to look at the boundaries of freedom of expression normatively and say, okay, well, where does government speech, where does political speech actually fit in that taxonomy, if you will, because you'd put freedom of the media the press, you know, right up there along with artistic creativity, for example, and possibly that type of speech might be lower down and mm -hmm. we need to protect. So that's the first thing. Then then secondly, um, uh, in the taxonomy that you had up, uh, Cassancy and sex taxonomy, the one uh, under, under intent, um, state of mind, you had a lie, and I would have preferred to remove that and put in knowingly, Knowingly, okay, yeah. Because I think a lie would conflict intention yeah. or state of mind with the falsity of the information it might help, right? Yeah, yeah. I think it's the only that's one. Exactly, that's yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and then thirdly, um, so I, I went and pulled up my constitution while you were talking, which is yeah. the constitution, and we have in section 195 under the heading public administration, chapter 10, the basic values and principles governing public administration, which require accountable public administration. So I think it might be worth coupling that with accountability. And then also by transparency must be fostered by providing the public with timely, accessible and accurate information. But the problem with Can that- Can you tell me the, yeah, uh, sure. the, the- I'll send it to you. The problem with section 195 is not justiciable. It's not? Justiciable. Ah, okay. All right, so okay. it's there as a value, and Ron and I have had this debate about using constitutional values and principles to inform the development of the law, but if it's only a value and if government's not believing in itself, what is, you, again, you need that strong, brave judiciary, but if it's not justiciable, how do you get a court on it anyway? No, it's a very good point. Okay. So that, that was that was my, my worry, and... Um, I just wanted to say that we were very, very embarrassed yesterday or the day before in South Africa because our dear president stood up. He was, I think, hosting somebody from Poland, I think, and he announced that we'd withdrawn from the ICC. Oh, really? Yeah, but it was false. He was oh. wrong, absolutely wrong, and he was corrected later on by his spokesperson to say that that was actually not the position of government at all because, you know, we, we meant to be hosting Putin soon and we're meant to be arresting Putin and there's a big issue about the fact that the ICC doesn't uh, is, is, is biased against okay. so that's clearly a false statement by the president which has grave harm because it impacts on our our public image on who we are as a country what our values are maybe we should talk to president Trump I'm going to send him your address that was just DJ's. No, no. <laughs> there you go. I, I, a brief comment about my first possible contradiction. <laughs> no. that, um, some confessions uh, here. I my 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 learning about free expression and everything, free press, free expression, and all of these things. It's coming from my studies here in the US. So uh, when when there are, I mean, for example, denial, denial of hate crimes or denial of Holocaust, which is a crime in Europe, I am against that. I am, my, my, my mind works much better in the understanding of the First Amendment and the, and the liberal values that inspired the First Amendment. Actually, my mentor here was Vince Blasi, which is a, a professor in, 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 in this university. So I included, because I, I, I was feeling that I have a contradiction when I write this, the, the preliminary paper, I included a very brief history of the actual malice doctrine uh, because 
even applying the actual, even understanding well the actual malice doctrine, the actual malice, of course, apply to false statements, but the state of mind should not be that you are lying and you know that you're lying. Mm -hmm. So I am I, I'm trying to exp to say there even 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 for the actual malice doctrine that I embrace and that I that I, you know, I like it and I try to expand and then even for the actual malice doctrine, a false statement that has been said knowingly that is false can have consequences. So that, that's that's why I, I, I include also something there trying to solve my contradiction because at some point I feel that I am a freedom of expression absolutist. <laughs> but in this case, I am not, okay? We have two questions from the same um, audience member and he actually is a judge in Brazil. So let me read those two off to you. He said, um, I agree with Dr. Eduardo, but the focus on regulating social media apparently is due to the potential harm that disinformation can cause to democracy and other fundamental rights. Then quickly combating the dissemination of false discourse seems to be a more urgent task. It's the first one. His um, first intervention was maybe the resolution of the problem in identifying fake news should be focused on the design and not on the content itself. This kind of approach deals with the problem of disinformation in general, not just focusing on specific content. So I'll leave you yeah, with that. No, no, but maybe the, the second one I don't understand exactly. The, the the question I think is more a comment, but in the in the first one for the judge in, in in Brazil, I agree. But what if what if we are in an ideal world that nobody lies? We are not going to be talking about these things. That's why I'm trying to focus on the origin of the misinformation and trying to to create some sort of disincentives that word exist in English, uh, disincentives to lie. And the disincentive could come from the law, regulation, and these kind of things. Okay, Though that that would be my my answer. But I'm not denying the problem of the the, the distribution of of of, of false statement uh, and the scale of the problem because of the internet and social platform. I'm not denying that. I am thinking that we need to do something. I'm not saying not, but I'm also. But my only goal here is to create another way to think about the problem and to try to create another way to solve the problem. That's that's my humble goal. Oh, Charlotte, yes. Yeah, just a super quick comment um, in relation to, um, you know, third parties that might do fact checking. I guess Andra should mention that too. Um, if, to the extent you end up talking about it, you might think about um, what you think about the US, uh, Facebook's experiment in the US with having authorized certain groups as fact checkers. So, you know, Facebook authorized a few actual kind of professional fact checkers, mm -hmm. um, PolitiFact and factcheck.org and a handful of other companies similar to that, and the Weekly Standard, which is, you know, part of the conservative media ecosphere. Um, and, you know, you can sort of guess what, um, you know, kind of social sure. pressures led to that and also what the kind of result was. But, you know, to the extent that's an example of this kind of, you know, outside fact check um, strategy. That might no, be I, I, I think that that is another avenue to think about this mm -hmm. problem. I work with some, I mean, in, in, in Latin America, we have a group, Chequeado, mm -hmm. uh, that started many years ago. And so they are professional fact checkers. They are very good and they expand their work to other countries in Latin America. I have fluent conversation with them for many years now. Mm -hmm. I think that the, the, their work is very important to solve this problem as well. It's another, it's another tool, it's another avenue, if, we, if, if I may say. Mm -hmm. However, in the same way as I said, we cannot solve the problem in the way that I am suggesting if we are not having independent judiciary to this, uh, talking about this avenue, I would say we need more education for the people, not formal education. I mean, I, I need people that if they read or hear, hear something, they can you know, try to check with some of the professional fact checkers. Mm -hmm. 
the real problem is that this is not taking place now because of what uh, there is a there's a name in 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 in, in Spanish. Uh, the concept is that the people only want to hear what they already believe, mm -hmm. and they don't want to you know the, the echo chambers exactly. So that that is complicated. So I I think I I, I like them and I use them, but. That's my case. My, and and I, for example, in the in, in some of the Argentine Argentine last last uh, elections, they 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 were you know uh, at the same time in which the candidates were uh, doing the debate. You can go online in their in their website, and they are checking every statement, and they say false, more or less false, more. Or less. So that's a very good tool, but you want to use it. I mean, you want to be open-minded in a way to say, well, I'm not going to believe everything of what they are saying. But this is unfortunately postmodernism. I think that is not the the way that we are working in our mind. But the, again. This is another problem, another big problem. What has one quick question, and then we promise to move on to Charlotte. Speaking <laughs> off of Charlotte's question, one other suggestion, and maybe one that's applicable to multiple papers, is uh, a focus on effective remedies, right? Mm -hmm. So even if we did have, you're going to put the politician in jail if he lies, and you're going to remove her from office, these seem perhaps counterproductive as remedies. But if you had a remedy that imposed ele adverse electoral consequences potentially on the person or their party, for telling lies, that would create a structural disincentive. Now, Charlotte mentions the Facebook experiment. She hinted at the outcome. I'm guessing it was bad because you have the weekly standard of the National Review and New Republic as fact checkers. They're not going to be credible. But if there were organizations or entities that were broadly accepted within the community as credible, maybe the remedy would be an electoral one when someone is shown to be a serial liar with respect to things that hit your A list or B list as opposed to your C or D. So as you think about the paper and the chapter and developing it, I really would think carefully about a remedial focus that would create a system of incentives that would lead government officials to be truthful rather than untruthful because the consequences of lying are sufficiently bad that it's less costly to tell the truth. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you so much and Charlotte. We greatly appreciate your patience, your endurance. Um, so let me fix this. And the lighting's a little bit Sorry, tough. No, 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 no. But I, I will say. Prove that a bit. There you go. Not quite in the shadows. <laughs> and I'm, can I get my. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Of course, Sorry, of course. Do, you, no, no, do you want no. with charger? Yes, please. This is a problem of these big companies. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. So Charlotte um, is the Julius E. Davis Professor at the University of Minnesota Law School. Um, Charlotte joined the law school faculty in the fall of 2022. She specializes in labor law, employment law, and constitutional law. Her interests include the intersection of workers' rights and the Constitution and how law supports or undermines worker voice and power. Thank you, Charlotte. Great. Well, let me first be, I guess, the last person to thank yeah. you for all of your work pulling this great conference together. I really, really appreciate it. Um, yeah, so, you know, I'm sort of the odd person out here um, in that I mainly write about labor and employment law. Um, I'm interested in the intersection of um, especially the First Amendment and uh, labor law, right, labor, collective labor rights. Um, and I'm also sort of the, you know, person in this volume who is most squarely in the civil society NGO space. Um, and so for that reason, I'm taking kind of a broader look um, at the relationship between sort of labor unions, collective action and worker empowerment, and, uh, you know, strengthening institutions such as um, media. Um, so that it's better able to kind of live up to stated values and withstand um, myths and disinformation. Uh, like I said in my in the email um, that I sent with the introduction to this piece, I've currently got kind of three ideas in the piece that that loosely hang together and that probably don't all belong in the same chapter. Um, and so to the extent people have